Ah, okay. Screw that one up. Okay, rock and roll. Let me remember how to do all these things. That out, get that out. Get this out of here. Get this out of here. How in the world did I share my screen again? That's right, I did it with this button. That's how I did it. Okay, rock and roll. Looks like we got a couple people in here, a couple people waiting in the lobby. I got my producer on the line. He says that everything is good. Just bear with me here for a couple seconds. We're gonna get started here in a bit. Thank you so much everybody for joining in early. Just gotta check a couple things out. Bear with me. Oh, this guy's the best. This guy's the best. So his his name is Evan. He's uh, he's hanging out. He's in a different province, but just magical. So. Same thing as last time, friends, we're going to be going through some hydronic uh, kind of the fundamentals, your basic overviews and whatnot, uh, things that I uh, want you to know, things that you need to know. We're going to be doing best practices, by the way. So some of the things you may be like, well, sometimes I don't have room for that or sometimes I can't do that. You know what? We get it. Totally understand. Strictly best practices today. Um, but comments, questions, concerns, you type them in to up at the top there. Uh, we're Scott up there at a question or you go to the chat mode, send me your questions. Uh, we'll get to them during a couple little um, breaks in the presentation and whatnot. I got my puppy back there. He's hanging, having a good time. Got my ukulele in hand. Uh, we got about nine minutes to go time. Um, so in the meantime, go grab yourself a sandwich. It's lunchtime, at least where I am. I guess for, for, for you out in uh, Western Canada, it might be breakfast. So go get some breakfast. Um, so, uh, you can come back and we're all fresh and we're ready and we'll drive some coffee into us and we'll really, really dive into it here. Have a good time. A lot of fun. Um, again, uh, I just want everybody here, don't be shy. Questions, comments, concerns, throw them up into the chat box. Uh, we've got a couple minutes before we start. Um, so like I said, get your coffees, get your breakfast, do what you need to do to make you happy because we're going to be in here for a bit. Um, but I promise I'll make it as fun as I possibly can for us. And uh, I am absolutely a super duper nerd when it comes to this stuff. So um, Throw at me what you can. Um, I'm excited for all questions, all comments. I'd love to hear it all. I'm, uh, I'm stoked. This is going to be a ton of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be fun.
I know what you're thinking. For those folks who just walked in, hey, did I sign up for a rock and roll concert or a hydronics 101? Well, friends, when you got a trainer with the folks at Equipco, like myself, you get a little bit of both. So stay tuned, have some fun. It's going to be a blast in here today. Going to be talking uh, hydronic fundamentals, the basics. Um, going to be going through some best practice procedures, things that uh, maybe you want to refresh her on, maybe things that are all brand new to you. We're going to be going over the the where and the why it all kind of goes down like that um this is a level one um so we're not going to be going too far down the old rabbit hole but hopefully we you know raise some questions and you're like hey i haven't done that before i didn't know about that and i'm like that's what we want to do we want to be here to help Five minutes to go time again thanks everyone for joining in early got a couple minutes where we're gonna be starting it off um, if you got your coffees if you got your waters maybe you're maybe you're having breakfast maybe you got some toast with some jam and peanut butter or whatever you go whatever's making you happy you know it's just all about we're gonna be focused we're gonna be engaged we're gonna be ready to rock and roll rock and roll with a little uh, ukulele songs have some fun with that um, Again, basics today, we're going to be going over our, uh, you know, um, <laughs> we're going to be going over the basics of uh, uh, what we need to know about a job. We're going to be going over heat loss, how it's done and why it's important. Uh, I'm going to be doing heat emitters. It's going to be just a, uh, just a ton of fun. I guarantee you, a ton of fun. talking also about different types of heat exchangers we're going to be going over that um, pros and cons of both I'm not here to pick favorites I'm not here to tell you which is better than the rest or anything like that that's not the purpose if you want to get into that um, you know that's 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 the job for the sales reps which uh, I do that as well but I'm super bad at it because all I like to do is make things work um, luckily you know I rep good products that uh, that work like crazy and uh, the manufacturers we work with they train like crazy um, I got, uh, most of my skill levels actually from attending trainings put on by manufacturers. The other half I got from going to job sites and seeing some pretty, pretty scary stuff out there. And you know, that's what, uh, that's what we want to do. I want to talk about what happens to me when I walk into a job site. I want to talk about what happens to you when you walk into a job site. I want to know what you know. I want to know, uh, I want you to explain, or I, I want to explain to you the the absolute panic that runs through my mind when I walk in and I see piping everywhere, and I'm like, I will never in a million years figure this one out. But um, as one of my slides is going to make a very clear point about when working with hydronics, never panic. Just fine. All right, we have two minutes to go time. Again, thank you folks for joining us here today. Um, we're gonna be, we're gonna be having some fun. Give me going over a lot of stuff. 
Um, Unity over, this is level one hydronics, basics, intro. Got your coffees, got your waters, got everything that you need. We are gonna be starting promptly at 12 though, because I have a, oh, I got this problem where I go off on tangents about things that I don't like and things I've seen in the field. And yep, I'm gonna talk about them as well. I promised, I promised uh, that my uh, colleagues that I wouldn't today, but well, I, I don't mind lying to them. So I feel pretty good about it. Um, but don't worry, you will know exactly when these tangents are coming. Uh, so we're going to be getting this up here into our full overview. Um, that handsome devil there on the, uh, on, on the right, believe it or not, that's me. When I'm not in quarantine growing the world's worst beard in HVAC, I am usually clean shaven, very uh, closely resembling to that of uh, some people say Mr. Clean. I don't know. I don't know if I see it, but what are you going to do? People are going to Call with the end of the call. Beneath that is my contact information. That is my cell phone number, which I'm going to say uh, a lot during this conversation, 647-883-8006. Email me at mread at, at equipgoltd.com. Um, first and foremost, friends, I'm here to help. Um, I do not claim by any means that I've seen every job and every particular thing that's ever come across hydronics uh, since the beginning of time. But one thing I will tell you is that I'm super interested in it. Um, I really enjoy this stuff. I am 100% certifiable hydronics and HVAC nerd. I love this stuff. Um, so I'm going to tell you what I know. I want to hear all about what you're coming out across out there in the field. Um, and we're going to kind of pick it apart, put it back together, see what Cantal do to build some, some hydronics knowledge. Just getting my notes here now. I'm going to put the phone on silent. Otherwise, everyone's going to get mad at me for that. You know, the rules get to turn your phones to silent during during meetings and whatnot, uh, but I digress. And it looks like all these green lights have all sorts of, or sorry, all green lights have come through, so I'm ready to rock and roll. Okay, um, so again, for those of us just joining here, my name is Matthew Reed. I'm with Equipco Limited. I'm uh, the technical sales dude. Um, here to help, here to talk about uh, hydronics, and everything that we need to know with regards to the entry level stuff that we wanna um, basically get a general understanding of the whole process as a whole, and then kind of put those pieces together with what we know to try to make the best system that we possibly can. So we're gonna be going over getting started with jobs. What are the basics? Like, what sort of jobs are they? What, uh, what can you possibly walk into it there? We're gonna be doing heat loss calculations. Um, which sounds super dry, but I'm super smart and I'm going to make it wicked fun for you. Heat emitters, got to get that heat out. Once you know how much heat that room needs, how do you get it into that room? That's a heat emitter. We're going to be talking about the boilers and the standard heat exchangers that are out there. There's a bunch of them, um, but we're going to like talk about the big, big ones that we're kind of seeing out there in the field right now. Um, we're going to be talking about mechanical room uh, training, or sorry, the mechanical room outlines, how, how we want to plan it out. Um, the boiler trim and planning. If we, maybe we got room, maybe we don't. Maybe we need to figure out a way to like find a piece that can do six things all in one, you know, and there's, there's stuff out there. Uh, we just need to know what, what does the job look like? We are going to be going over water quality. This is a big one. We're seeing um, a lot of the of boiler manufacturers out there and manufacturers of trim and equipment that, uh, you know, their, their pieces may fail, but it's also because they're completely jammed full of calcium and magnesium um, scale. And, you know, that's it's not the manufacturer's fault that it's happening. It's, it's the water that's causing these issues. We're going to talk about that and why that happens, things you can do to get around that. We're also going to be talking about domestic hot water, how to make it primarily, first and foremost. We're going to be over a simple formula um, with regards to sizing tankless water heaters, um, and with regards to how it's standard water heater works, just domestic hot water, how to make it, what it takes. You know what it takes? Fire, lots of it. And that fire can come in natural gas, propane, or electric. It's all about the BTU, baby. We are gonna be talking about cooling. Cooling's, you know, Im important when it talks about we're doing a whole job, great, you got it heated, but how are you gonna cool it down? Is there pieces that uh, you're gonna wanna uh, think about for that? And then a and A. I just got, so we start here. Um, oh, we're getting a note here. We are getting a note that we want we want five more minutes before we get rocking along. Yeah, you no problem with that, man. That's that's totally fine. So, um, in the meantime, while we're kind of waiting on that, um, let's talk about here. We just we are April 9th or eighth. Uh, I, I believe it's the ninth. I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure. I have lost 
some track of time. Um, but uh, it did snow this morning, if you can believe that or not. Uh, we got uh, three centimeters of snow. I live uh, somewhere around Barrie, Ontario, um, where we get uh, not as much snow and cold as uh, uh, Saskatchewan. Um, but our own little city just gets uh, all the snow that Ontario gets. Every time it snows there, it snows here. Um, so one thing I do understand is cold. I get that. I was actually born and raised in northern Ontario, uh, way up there. Um, so I'm, I'm very familiar with, with, the, with the cold temperatures. Um, I, know, I know what it feels like to be, uh, you know, in, in, in minus 45, minus 50 temperatures. Um, but, you know, we also get super hot and super humid. So we need to, got to figure some things out with that. Okay. Um, and, oh, song request. Yes. Uh, somewhere over the, ra oh, someone's seen the, uh, what's his name? It's, uh, uh, Iggy or Ezekiel or someone like that. Do I know how to play that? Absolutely not. Israel, that's it exactly. I don't know how to play that. Absolutely not. I barely know how to play that thing as it is. I just think it's super fun sounding and very, very nice. Um, but uh, I mean, tell you what I'm going to do for you though, my friend Ryan Wells, I'm going to practice. And I'll get back to you. How's that sound? Okay. Okay. So we are, uh, we're at our time here. We're going to get going. So like I said, Heat loss, heat emitters, boilers, mechanical room trim layout, water quality, domestic hot water, cooling, and Q&A. Keep those uh, cues, cues coming as often as you want. Um, I'm not going to be able to get them all immediately, but as they do pop up, I'll get to them. So, I broke it. Here we go. Getting started. Get that out of the way for a moment. I'll pick that back up by the end. So, we have two basic types of systems. When it all comes down to it, all things being equal, there's two different types. There's your re and re, and there's your new systems. Re and re meaning remove and replace. New system meaning maybe it's a brand new house, they're, they're, they still have exposed dry, or sorry, exposed studs. You're able to do all sorts of work in there. Um, you're not adapting to an existing system is the big portion of it. Um, and those two systems require different sorts of thought processes as to what you want to think about and consider before, before getting into it and uh, moving forward. Um, <clears throat> Re and re. Like I said, that is a new boiler adapting to an existing system. Um, so like I said, maybe that's based on a, uh, the, they're putting on an addition or maybe it's a home renovation. Um, the, uh, the, oh my goodness. The basic overviews uh, that we're going to be talking with, with the re and re's is those big two. Um, so the existing system, um, that you're going to be adding on to is going to be consistent of like, is our system already big enough to handle the load that we're going to be adding on to it? Or do we need to do a whole new piping schematic and detail and everything like that? Um, and with regards to home renovation, are we just tying in or are we talking about from this, we're going to be doing a re and re of everything that we can, in which case are we running new pipes behind drywall, stuff like that. And for that, Couple of quick questions. First one, most important one, I can't stress this one up, is gonna be the customer's budget. They come to you, they're saying they're doing a whole home renovation, they want a snow melt in the driveway, they wanna put uh, in-floor in the basement, they want rats to the rest of the house, they want an air handler and a high V, and they've got about $730. Um, you, you know what I mean? Like there's, they, they need to understand that these are higher end systems and they're gonna come with a higher end price tag. Uh, these are, uh, going to be labor intensive. They're going to be, you know, costing a couple of dollars and we need to make those informations up front that, yeah, the system is going to cost you X amount of dollars because of there is a, a lot of moving parts involved in it. Um, so make sure that you have that budget addressed first and foremost. Maybe they want a Ferrari and they can actually afford a, uh, uh, I don't know, a, a Corvette, you know, de depending on what their, their needs are. Okay. Is the current system working as effectively as possible? Meaning, does their current system, do they have any hot and cold spots inside the house already? Um, it, do they have a, I go to lots of homes where they say, it's like, okay, this is my house. I want to do this and that and the other thing. I go around, do an inspection of the house. Like, oh, don't worry about that radiator. That radiator has never worked ever. And I ask why they have no idea. So we can usually fix these things when we get into it. And usually the problem is somewhere in the mechanical room by the time it all comes down to it. Um, is it sized right? Do we even have the boiler horsepower to do the load that they have existing, let alone the new stuff that they want to get done to it? Or 
is a way oversized. It's maybe one of those old style cast iron boilers that's, you know, 300,000 BTUs into a 1500 square foot house. That's going to be another issue um, that we need to address. And you can do anything. I, nothing is impossible with hydronics, but you just got to ask a couple questions. Uh, and is the current system designed appropriately to accommodate for a modern boiler system upgrade? Um, what that means is, you know, if you're changing maybe a gravity system um, and it's, you know, got the big three or four inch pipes in there, uh, you, you can't oversize pipes, or you going to be fine with that, but do we need to put a couple pumps in? Is it, is it, uh, does we have room for the condensate pumps? Um, because these new systems are going to be uh, condensing. Um, most of the time, not a lot of people go with the old style uh, common vent system. So we'll, we just, just some points to keep in mind as you're, as you're figuring it all out. Um, so, sorry, sorry about that. Sorry, got it. Okay. Is, uh, so basically removing a boiler and putting in a new boiler sounds super simple. Uh, you take out the old, put in the new. Sounds simple enough. Um, but these are things that we come across out there in the field a lot um, that can arise, usually based on the fact that the original system was never designed right to, to begin with. Um, maybe they've been pumping into the expansion tank for years and years and years and never had flow there. Maybe the piping was always too small. Um, basically, the main issues that I see when I go to job sites, you have the wrong pipe size, wrong circulator size, um, maybe you're over pumping or undersizing, wrong pipe size is actually the biggest one that I see, bar none compared to any of them. Um, poor water quality, um, you know, where you're, you're talking about a tremendous amount of sludge going through the system, um, or you got a lot of uh, scale buildup already. And then, the, you know, get the wrong placement of various systems and components, uh, such as the expansion tank. That's, again, usually a big one that I see. Um, and when it comes to a re and re, the parts that you are changing, the parts that you are figuring out, uh, usually it's a boiler change out or maybe a pump change out or something like that. The pieces that you change, that is paramount to ensuring the success of all these projects. Um, and so what that I mean uh, is that you need to protect what you are working with and what you are changing. Oh, 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 I think something's gone. Well, is that friend who just had a post? Oh my God. Okay. Sorry, we're just gonna keep on going here. We still have a bunch of attendees here, everything's good. So, moving forward, like I said, protecting the equipment work is paramount to the success of, uh, of, of these projects. So, new systems. Complete mechanical systems, this is a brand new start to finish um, uh, design build that you're going to be doing uh, and it's going to be a, a whole different uh, or a whole new existing uh, sorry a whole new system you're going to be adding in again same questions that you need to be asking here is like, number one what sort of budget are we talking about um, again maybe they want that Ferrari and they're going to get themselves a uh, only like a you know Ford Focus or something like that. There's lots of different pieces that could be involved. You want to talk about structural concerns as well, like your ceiling height. Um, I've got, uh, I've had a couple of customers uh, along the way um, that they would, that they wanted to put radiant flooring all throughout their house, and especially in the basement. And then when I tell them that I'm going to need to add a couple inches into the floor, um, that kind of creates a little bit of uh, an, an, an issue. Um, so they say, God, oh, I don't want to lose any ceiling heights. Like, well, we can't do one without the other. Um, so these are things you want to run past your customer beforehand to let them know what they're going to be up against. Um, or the mechanical room size. Uh, lots of times nowadays, I've seen my mechanical rooms going um, under the stairways, uh, usually in the basement, maybe in a small little closet. Is going to be even big enough to put anything uh, in that that they kind of want to do. Maybe they need a hundred gallon indirect, uh, but they only have room for a small combi boiler. These are things that we can work with and we can work around, but we need to explain to our homeowner that we need more room to put the equipment in that, that, that what they're looking for. Um, and then complete system requirements. Primarily, we want to know what, what success looks like for, for, for the homeowner. Um, but by that, I mean, you need to have a clear understanding with your homeowner of what they expect the finished job to look like. If as long as everything's aligned and everybody, you know, um, everybody agrees that this is how it's all going to unravel. This is what they want everything to look like and everything to, 
um, everything to you know end up looking like in the end, um, then everybody will hit success at the end. But make sure that those itinerary pieces are mapped out uh, throughout the entire um, conversation. That they know what steps you are taking to hit those successes that what they are looking for. Um, now, the hydronics co. Now, this is this is an important part. The 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 B two fourteen the the hydronics co book. Um, it is out there. It is published. A couple of friends of mine. Uh, that's a bit of a lie, but some some very uh, some some people that I know got together and they wrote the B two fourteen. And it's been added to and adapted uh, different places across the country. But uh, it does have a couple points in there that we're going to highlight. Number one. Um, new systems must be designed in accordance with the B214 hydronics code. Now let's talk about the key points that are in here. Um, all system components shall be selected according to the system design. So when you are getting your system design done, whether you're doing it by yourself or if you're getting uh, a designer to put it together for you, but all components shall be selected according to the design of the system, meaning that you're not going to have over pipe. Oh, sorry, uh, you're not going to have over pumping. Um, you're not going to have a boiler that's way too large or too small. Select the components that have been designed to work with all these pieces. Um, this is one is kind of a no brainer, but uh, comes up more often than you think. Uh, the heat source output shall not be less than the heat load indicated, meaning that, you know, basically don't undersize the boiler. Uh, we, 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 have, we do these heat losses for reasons that we can get the right size boiler into these homes. Um, but the heat loss is 105 uh, and you have a boiler just kind of sitting in your warehouse there that's 100 and you're like, well, it's close enough. Um, thing about it is when we design these systems, we design it for the coldest day of the year on average. Um, that's how all, all, all systems are designed. Um, it does sometimes even get colder than the coldest day of the year for the design uh, layout. So by undersizing the boiler, even by a little bit, if the temperature does drop significantly, you can be doing a pretty big disservice to the homeowner. Um, now, when we're talking about BTUs going into a home, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of these things going in. Uh, so a difference of, you know, 5,000 or so, it's not that it's going to be a huge impact, um, but nobody wants that call from the homeowner that their, their, their boilers are running, you know, constantly and they can't get the house up to temperature. Nobody wants that. So size the boiler appropriately. This is important. Um, the water used to fill the system sh shall fulfill the requirements for water specified by the manufacturer of various system components. Um, we're going to be going over this here in the end, but lots of manufacturers, they will outline what water quality they require. They talk about total dissolved solids. Um, they, they, they require between 50 and you know 200 parts per million of these total dissolved solids. They have a pH level that they require to go into their systems. Um, so that's going to be pieces that we're going to be talking about when we get into the water quality side of it. These are required by the manufacturers. If your system fails because of water quality, it's not the it's not going to be a warranty call for a, ma for a manufacturer of, uh, of the parts and pieces and components. It's going to be an issue for you as the installer. So let's be sure we address that and get in front of it. Um, person performing the installation shall be trained in such, in such functions. Lucky for my friends out here, you were all getting trained right now to the basics. Um, it's kind of a big one. So if you if you are a MY thermal mechanic or you're a Bradford White mechanic, um, these are the boilers that you like that you 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 want to work with. Do yourself a favor, train up in them, um, get to know as much about them as you possibly can, and you are going to be just fine. But it is a requirement inside the code that you shall be you know trained to do what you're going to be supposed to be doing. Okay, all serviceable components shall be. Uh, of the heating system shall be installed in a manner to facilitate the servicing. So what I mean by this, ball valves and unions, you cannot possibly have enough of them. You can't have too many, can't have uh, too many of these things by any means. You should be able to take this whole system apart if you need to. Um, just because, you know, you don't think you're ever going to be uh, servicing uh, maybe a dirt separator or something like that does not mean that, you know, it's going to cost you a tremendous amount of money to throw a ball valve and a union in there. Don't be afraid of them. They they, they, they don't have too much of the job, and by the time you get it all done, you're going to thank yourself for making sure that these parts are serviceable. You can get in there and kind of do these changes and do these cleaning up that you're looking for. Um, so, final. Oops. The heat loss, heat gain design. In order to get a city permit to perform any HVAC and hydronic work, 
Um, design must be performed by the owner or a qualified BCIN holder. Uh, in the case of new construction, the design must be performed by a registered, BC, registered and insured BCIN company. Now, now, design firms for hydronic works, you can find them uh, on a web page. It's quartz.com, Q-U-A-R-T-S.com. And we'll send that out in a link when we send out our, uh, our training guide after, after this is all over. Um, but you can check these out. Make sure that the designer that you're working with is registered and is insured with, um, with NRCAN. And that way there you can ensure that, you know, you're getting the best designer you possibly can. The reason you want to go with something that's registered and insured is that if anything does go wrong with the system, there's shared liability is what it basically comes down to. And, and that's why actually why the um, registered and insured B BCIN design outline was even created. And like I said in there, uh, the firms are in good status and registered with NRCAN and searchable in courts, public search registry. And again, we'll, we'll send you that link so you have a look at that. Okay. So we're going to be doing a heat loss. I saw a couple questions pop up here. Just have a quick look, see if there's anything in there um, for me to have a look at. Um, okay. So yeah, if you got questions, th throw them at me there. Um, I'll get to them as soon as I possibly can. This one here is specifically with regards to um, Liam. But yeah, when you when you get a chance, type that one in, and we'll get. We'll get that sorted out for you here. Uh, so we're going to tell you about conducting a heat loss. What do you need? Uh, you need your inside design temperature, which is usually approximately 70 degrees. We're going to be talking Fahrenheit throughout this uh, presentation here. Uh, then we're going to be talking about the outdoor design value, your R value, and your magic formula. Now, the outdoor design temperature, that varies from different cities across the country. Um, here in um, Barrie, Ontario, I believe we designed to minus 10 Fahrenheit, minus 10 or minus 7, something like that. Um, but like you say, it'll, it'll vary across the company. Your R value, that's your insulation value. So uh, when, you're, when you're constructing a home, the R value of the insulation, it'll be stated in the, in the um, overview of what insulation that you're putting in as to what R values are, is, is in the insulation you're putting in. It'll also be in your windows, but it'll be in the windows as a U value. And then after that, all you need is a little magic formula and away you go. So what is this magic formula? Q equals A times U times Delta T. Don't panic. I know that that sounds, uh, that that formula sounds kind of crazy, um, but it's really actually quite, quite easy. So Q is the required B to use. Why is it Q? Um, there is a scientific mathematical term that goes with that, but whatever, it just means B to use. A, super easy, that's your area. Your U is your R value. Um, in order to find U, it's one divided by R. So if you have R20 insulation, one divided by 20 gives you your U value. And of course you got your Delta T, which is your outdoor temperature versus your indoor. And that is the differential that you're looking for. So if you're designing in a place, like I said, around here in Barrie, where we designed to minus 10, and then we want the indoor temperature to be 70, we have an 80 degree Delta T. So what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna do a quick little example here. Now, um, what I've done is I've taken a standard 10 by 10 wall with R20 insulation in it. Um, I used uh, an outdoor design temperature at minus 22 Fahrenheit, maybe we're way up there in uh, northern Saskatchewan, something like that. And then we just run it through the formula. So Q equals 100 times 0.5 times 92. 100, of course, being 10 times 10. Uh, 0 0.05 is 20, 1 divided by 20. Um, and then the outdoor design temp differential where we're going from minus 22 to 70. So we have a heat loss for that particular wall of 460. Now, what about windows and doors in that wall? So what we do with that, again, is fairly straightforward, fairly simple. We take the area of the window, subtract it from the area of the wall, do the magic formula for both of them, and then we just quickly add them up. So it's really, really, really straightforward and easy. So we take that 10 by 10 wall with, now I just kind of changed the R value a little bit, with an R24. So it's got a two by two window and it's got a U value of five. So we find the R value or the uh, BT required for the window, which is four, two times two, times 0.5, one divided by 24, uh, times, 90, times 92, which is your temperature differential. So you get 182, that's your BT required for the window. And then your wall, which is now 96 square feet, because we take out the window, times that by 0.4, which is one divided by um, the R value of the wall is 24, times that again by the temperature differential, 352. So for that, for that existing exterior wall with that one two by two window in it, we get a 537 BT required for that one exterior wall. So when we're doing heat loss for a home, um, we are only, re and this is just for 
quick overviews. Uh, we're only concerned with exterior walls. So if it's an interior wall that you need to get into, we're not super concerned with the design with that. This is gonna be for quick estimation that we wanna get these numbers put together with. Um, so what I do for, for, for homes is you, instead of doing, you know, exterior wall by exterior wall, um, you can just add up all the wall areas inside of a house. Um, so for example, this that you can see right here in front of you, this is actually my home. Um, I have complete total exterior wall uh, surface area of 3,960 square feet. Um, and then my home was renovated in 2014 to change the R value of the walls to R24. Um, I have a total window square area of 40 square feet and my E value of that is 0.5. Um, the outdoor design temp, again, it's not here for Barry, but that is for just a design number here. We're doing minus 22 Fahrenheit. Indoor design temperature is plus 70. So what we do is we do the whole thing all together. So with my 3,960 square feet of wall space, um, that's 14,572 BTUers required for the walls. For the windows, 40 square feet of windows, we're going to do the formula, Q times A times U times delta T, 1,840 BTUs required for all the windows. So the whole home requirement for the heat loss is 16,412. Now one thing I didn't add into this equation is ceiling and floors. Um, so for ceilings, you're going to talk about ceilings leading into an attic. Um, those are usually extremely well insulated, like several in the neighborhood of about R70. So you get very little heat loss through that. And then as for the floor heat loss, um, for that you need soil conductivity and areas um, with regards to where you are. And that's not what we're going to be talking about today. Today we just want a basic overview. So if a customer says to you, I want to do um, a furnace in my house, you just want to give them a budget estimate before you send it over to a designer. This is a way you can get a rough estimate. So even if you took this number from my home of the 16,500 16, BTUs required for my house, um, the smallest furnace that I know of on the market is a 30,000 BTU. I believe it's made by uh, Napoleon, um, but that'd be the only one that I could possibly go into here. Um, but that's again, a quick overview of how to budget estimated heat loss for a house, okay? Once you have the heat loss, um, actually, before I get into that, I saw a couple more questions pop in here. Let me get to those. And that is, uh, that is unpleasant there. Okay, but anyway, so we have the heat loss for the house was 16,500. So if I'm gonna be doing it by an air handler, I can size that air handler uh, quite simply. You know, we look through the charts for what we have existing. Now, this is from a friend of mine, uh, the friends over at EcoSmart that have uh, graciously provided to me this heat loss, uh, sorry, the, the, the BTU capabilities of their air handlers. So I know that if I need 16,500, I can size a pump at four GPM, run this thing through at 130 degrees Fahrenheit while within the condensing temperatures, which we'll get to. Um, and at 300 CFM, I'll be able to get the heat loss into my house with this particular model of air handler that they're talking about. So again, once you do have your heat loss, you figure out how to get that heat into the home. Now with an air handler, we're talking about whole home, but maybe we are not talking about air handlers. Maybe we're talking about baseboards. You wanna do it room by room. Let's look back to this room. This room had a heat loss of about 600 BTUs per square foot. So, or sorry, 600 BTUs for this room. So if I wanted 600 BTUs, I go over here to my BTU chart and I don't cross into 600 BTUs till I get down here. So I know that in order to get 600 BTUs, I gotta be moving 0.6, uh, sorry, well, let's do this right here, four GPM um, at 180 degree temperature per foot uh, to get my 180 BTUs. Or I could divide that in half um, and go down and use a 300 uh, BTU per, per, per foot of uh, baseboard heating. I can still get my 600 BTUs, I just need to increase the length of the uh, baseboard that we're gonna be going over. So that's how we size the radiator per room. Air handlers are done whole home, radiators are done per room. And these are everywhere. Like all the manufacturers publish their heat um, outputs of their heat emitters. Um, so you can dive into these things anywhere, check it out, size it properly. And again, once you find one that you like, it's a good idea to probably, you know, stick with it, stick around it. Um, that you're going to be, you know, becoming familiar with the product. How does it work? What are the quirks to it in case there is any? Um, for example, this piece here, this is a, uh, a slant fin. Um, probably the most popular baseboard in all of, uh, all of Canada. Slant fins have been around for 
years and years and years. We've all um, seen it in job sites, we've all used it, commercial, residential, and their charts are fairly easy to understand. It shows you how fast you want to move the water, at what temperature to get what BTUs per foot. Super easy to work with, but they all have it. Find one that you like and stick with it. Okay. Finally, we're going to talk about Radiant. Now, Radiant's a real tough guy um, as far as when it comes to checking out the BTU's output of a, of a Radiant floor system. The reason being, there's so many variables with it. Um, but uh, one thing I will tell you with roughly the most common PEC size that goes into Radiant in-floor heating is half-inch PECs. Um, a recommended circuit length is 300 feet. Um, when you get longer than 300 feet, the head loss starts to take, it looks like a hockey stick, it goes up quite rapidly. Uh, we average, on average, space these things out between 9 and 12 inches on center spacing. And our usual flow rate for these things is about 0.5 to 0.6 GPM per loop. With that math, we get about between 22 and 30 BTUs per square foot of radiant heating. So if I have this room and I've got my 550 BTUs required for this room, you know, I take my 550 and I divide that by 30, get how many, how many um, square feet I would need uh, to figure out exactly if I have enough room uh, to get that and, and a pipe and floor to heat this room. So in this case, it'd be 25 feet roughly. Um, so do I have 25 feet of floor space in this room to get the heat emitters in? Yes, no, and make your decisions from there. Uh, now there are ways that you can that you can increase the BTU output of radiant tubing. Um, the aluminum panels, for example, they work like crazy to bump up that heat output. It turns it from where it's just a standard PEX line into being a big heat emitter. So imagine like a bunch of uh, aluminum rads in your floor, like inside the concrete, or not concrete, but just underneath the uh, subfloor. So you can get a ton of BTUs more out of that. Um, also, you can bump up the insulation beneath that PEX. Um, because one thing that I, 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 I can't stress enough is that heat by no means does it rise at all. Um, I don't care what your grade nine science teacher told you, it does not rise. Heat transfers to cold. Now it's true, warm air rises and warm water rises, absolutely. That's basically how a hot water heater works, um, is by the warm water rising to the top and it's the first stuff that comes out. Um, but heat itself as a medium transfers to cold. Uh, nature loves balance, so it'll find wherever it, that, that cold temperature is, and unless you direct it where it needs to go, it'll mitigate itself anywhere. Um, anywhere in, in, in that it is colder than where it is right now. So beef up the insulation beneath, drive that heat up, and away you go. So a couple things to consider. Um, there's a ton of variables to consider with, the, with regards to the radiant heating. Um, What's your overpour going to be? Are you going to be using gypcrete? Are you using concrete? Is it going to be those heat panels, like I mentioned, that's going to be giving you a much larger BTU per square foot output? Um, our friends at Upanar make them, Rayhelm make them, Heatlink have a couple. You know, they can bump that BTU heat output into well into the 30s um, to, to give you more heat coming out of these, these heat emitters. Um, now, if, if it's just a standard, you know, insulation packs on with a gypcrete overpour, gypcrete has a different density than standard concrete. So that's going to create a different uh, heat slab. So these are things as a designer that I'm going to want to know when I'm designing your system for you. You need to tell me so that I can get the piping sized right. Okay. The next piece I'm going to get into is the staple up. That's when you're running heating through the joist spaces in a ceiling. Now, for the joist space heating, uh, one thing I want to just clarify before we get any further into that one, uh, and I've come across way too many jobs for this not to kind of mention it, that joy space heating PEX needs to be touching the bottom of that subfloor in the joy spacing. I see lots of times where it's run along the sides of the joist and then insulated underneath that with a ceiling put up. And I've, we've I've taken on too many ceilings in my life um, to not bring this up. Uh, it goes PEX, into the subfloor, right against the subfloor, insulate it like crazy, as much as you possibly can. You can't insulate that one too much at all, and then put your ceiling up. Um, this is also a good place when we're doing a staple up system in the joy spacing where aluminum heat transfer panels are an extremely good idea. It's hard to drive heat through that, through, through a staple up system. You're usually talking about a subfloor, um, 
And then maybe you have, uh, maybe you even have an additional um, floor on top of that before you get to your hardwood tile, um, stuff like that. So it can take a lot to drive that heat through a staple up. Um, it also usually requires warmer temperatures than a standard in-floor. Uh, if you're doing an in-floor with Jibcrete, you know, you can run anywhere from 90 to, you know, 110, something like that. Um, well, with the staple up, you're definitely going to be want to be getting into the, you know, warmer temperatures of the 120 uh, to make sure you're getting enough heat into that area to drive it through there. And then finally, floor coverings. If I've got to heat through that subfloor and then I got to heat through hardwood, um, that's going to be a different transfer of heat rate uh, than if I'm doing, you know, uh, subfloor and then tile. Tile is actually a pretty good conductor of heat, so we'd want to move that through. Clay is actually pretty decent at it. Um, on the flip side of that, if I'm going, you know, subfloor and then a layer of foam, and then a layer of carpet, carpet is super tricky to heat through. Not to mention that foam is in essence uh, an insulator. So I'm going to put a lot of heat there to drive through these things to get the right floor coverings. So when I'm asking for your floor coverings to do your design output for you, um, I'm not doing that because I'm interested in what color, or sorry, what, what new trends and fads are in for the flooring industry. I genuinely need to know so I can make sure that I get enough heat into that room. It might change the flow rate, change the temperatures, all these pieces. Um, one thing I can tell you is that if you don't know what sort of floor coverings that the homeowner has or will be changing to for their re and re versus new build, um, if you don't know, ask the homeowner. The homeowner, I assure you, is going to know what they're going to want to put on top of that. And then from that, we can do our, our formulas and our designs and get you the right, um, you know, uh, the, right, the right one in detail to get the heat where you need it. Okay, so let me have a quick look. Uh, no new questions. Okay. Um, and now we're going to be getting into boilers and protection. All right. So... When it comes to boilers, there's two basic schools out there right now. There's your condensing boilers and your non-condensing boilers. Now your condensing boilers, um, you're gonna wanna run them at a nice, either at a nice low temperature to make sure you get that uh, nice cool return temperature. Somewhere below 135 is kind of the magic number to make these things condense. Um, and that's how they get their most efficiency. And they usually vent with uh, plastic venting. Now your non-condensing is designed to work at a much warmer temperature to see warmer temperatures come back to them on the return. Again, plus 135. I actually like to see plus 140 coming back to non-condensing boilers, 140 minimum, um, because that heat exchanger is not designed to see condensate. And when I say not designed for it, the condensate that we create um, with condensing boilers uh, and even non-condensing boilers as it escapes the house, uh, it's mildly acidic. Now it's mildly acidic because our atmosphere is primarily nitrogen. Um, so when we are going through the process of combustion, we're burning our CH4 natural gas um, combined with the plethora of chemicals that we have in our atmosphere, the majority of which being nitrogen, some of the uh, byproducts of that is um, nitric acid. So that it's not super acidic. It's about the same as either orange juice or, or um, a cola beverage, I guess I'll say, uh, but it, it will still eventually eat away at things. Copper and, uh, and uh, noble metals being super easy to eat away at. So condensing boilers are designed to see that acidity level in the condensate come back, where non-condensings are not. We can uh, see non-condensings rotted out quite quickly when we subject them to condensing conditions. And there's piping ways that we can put these things together to uh, make one do one uh, or, or the other. Um, one thing I'll tell you, there is no boiler on the planet that, as it is, out of the box, in theory, burns any more than about 89%, 88 to 89%. Um, it's not that we get into the, the 95 to 96% until we get into um, the condensing mode. Because what we're able to do is we actually pull those BTU loads out of the condensate that we create. It's about 900 BTUs per gallon of condensate that we create. So although the, the burner itself is burning at its 90% efficient, we're able to pull out X amount of gallons of condensate per hour, and that adds back into our heat load, and that's how we get the 90 plus percent efficiencies. It has nothing to do with combustion efficiencies. It's strictly with regards to how much can we make this thing sweat. Some heat exchangers do a better job at it than others. Downfired heat exchangers are a really good way to make things condense. Um, where your front-fired heat exchangers 
uh, are also quite good, but you just tend to sweat more out of a downfire. Um, gravity is a wonderful thing and uh, use it when you possibly can. Again, uh, as I mentioned before, condensation usually occurs when you're right around that 135 uh, return water temperature mark. So if you have non-condensing, make sure that you are well above that in your return water temperature. Um, now a non-condensing boiler, as I mentioned, it's still only going to burn in that, well even a little bit less than that actually because they don't have the high efficiency burner types, uh, but usually around that 80% efficient and that's out of the box brand new. Um, but these guys uh, specifically must be protected against condensate, meaning that you make sure that your return temperature is well over that 135. Usually when we're talking about a non-condensing boiler, we have a supply temperature going out to the system, usually at a minimum of 150 to 160 degrees. Um, much more commonly, we see 180 degrees being supplied with a condensing, or sorry, a non-condensing boiler to make sure that within regards to that delta T that we give to the system, we're well within that usually industry standard of 20 degrees that one pitch us way over that 140 mark. So that's what we need to see with a non-condensing system. Um, both of them have their place, I guess we'll say, in the market. Non-condensing boilers are great for high temperature applications, air handlers and radiators all day long. Um, if that's what your system is made up primarily of, you can save some dough by going to a non-condensing, at least for now. The, the codes are going to be changing soon, if not already, for a couple provinces out there um, that you already require to have a modulating condensing boiler out there. Where condensing boilers, they can be used much more effectively in low temperature applications. Um, usually that it usually refers to low temperature uh, radiators or radiant in-floor heating. Um, so this is kind of the big two applications that can be used for. That being said, if you're dealing with an indirect water heater that usually likes to see that nice and nice hot temperature being supplied to it, somewhere around the 180 degree mark, you can use in, in theory either or. So just whatever system you're working with, be sure to adjust and adapt for that indirect water heater if you're using one. Or play with the specs of that indirect. You can make an indirect create a ton of hot water by providing it 150 degree water and then returning it at 130. You're still within your condensing application. Um, you just need to know that your hot water output is gonna be less than 150 than it would be at your industry standard of 180. So just things to keep in mind when we're designing a system as to what sort of maximum efficiencies do you want to be playing with. Okay, we have two basic types of heat exchangers out in the market right now. You have your Giannone, which is the one on the, on the left, and then you have your fire tube, which is the one on the right. Um, they both have their pros and cons. I'm not here to talk about which one's better than the other because I really, I have no skin in that game. It doesn't really matter to me. I just want to tell you about what I know about them, and then you can make your own decisions. So the Giannone heat exchanger, um, it's got a considerably higher head loss. So it means it usually takes a bit bigger of a pump to drive the water through this heat exchanger. Um, but at the same time, super easy to take apart and clean. There's only about four to seven screws uh, to take this burner off and get into the heat exchanger and get that thing cleaned up. On the flip side of that, on the right, like I said, we have our fire tube heat exchanger where we have, um, really, really low head loss, um, but it is a bit more complex to take apart and clean. Um, this was actually sold when it first hit the marketplace out there as, the, as a self-cleaning heat exchanger. Uh, that is absolutely not true at all. You still need to take it apart. You still need to clean it. Uh, the, the reason why it was built out as a self-cleaning is because as it sweats, the condensate run down uh, inside the unit in theory, giving it a wash, even though it's just not it's just not technically true. Um, it does do something for it, but definitely not enough to classify it as clean. Um, and plus, if you're burning propane through either of these, propane is super dirty. Uh, I don't care where you're getting it from, or if it's the top of the, of the propane tank or the bottom of the propane tank, it's still a dirtier fuel. So you still need to make sure you get these jackets cleaned out. Um, we're gonna be going over this, the features and benefits of both. Um, just so you have a bit of an understanding as to how they all work. Now, here's a quick video on the uh, fire tube heat exchanger. Um, you can be watching this. We're going to be taking it, you know, from start to finish, how it all operates, how it works. So just have a look here. Uh, this is basically the, the cycle of combustion and construction for a fire tube.
sorry about that. I think going again. So there's a burner on the top. Like I said, it's a down fired unit. It makes it really good at, at uh, sweating and condensing. And this is the application of how the water will be going through these guys and how they work. Comes in cold. That's what makes it sweat like crazy. Up it goes, picks up heat through the heat exchanger as it rises. Now here we're going down through one of the fire tubes. These are the things that need to be cleaned out without question. Very fine brushes, you can get in there, you can get a decent clean on these guys. And that's it. That's kind of the overview of how that heat exchanger, in essence, how it all kind of goes together and works. Um, the downfire burner going through the fire tube, water comes into the bottom and up, making it super effective at uh, making it sweat uh, um, as it uh, as it works. So it does have its features. Um, he said it is a bit more complicated with regards to how um, to take it apart and clean it, um, but uh, it is it is usually quite efficient and the super low head loss through these guys makes it you can do some pretty interesting fun piping schematics um usually with these high efficiency boilers we have to do primary secondary piping but with a fire tube you can actually get away with just a standard in out system um depending on the system over you as a whole but that's going to be up to you know you, you you and me as we sit there and design a an overview for a system now here is the, well, it used to be called the Genoi, now it's called the uh, Sermeta, but this is how this heat exchanger works. Again, this is the fire tube. So imagine someone, or sorry, the water tube. Imagine someone's taken a one inch piece of stainless steel and ovaled it, and that's what's running the water through. Okay, so let's have a look at this guy. These are flue gases moving through our chambers. Sees the coldest water first, making it sweat as much as it possibly can. And then up and out. Um, and that's that's basically the, the ORI for the uh, uh, Giannoni Ceramata heat exchanger. Now, the way that this guy works, you have our burner back here on the burner plate mounts into the faceplate of this heat exchanger. Um, it hits the, uh, the the fire plate at the back of that heat exchanger. And then one thing to take note of, if you might have saw it in the video, is that it did have its uh, flue gases um, kind of escaping through in between the, the, the stainless steel rings. Um, so for everyone who's taken one of these things apart and cleaned it up, um, you may or may not have actually kind of really gotten in between these fins to clean them up, but that is something that's relatively important to making sure that you're getting maximum efficiency out of these uh, out of these type heat exchangers. One thing I have come across in the past is that these type heat exchangers are pretty prone um, to what I, I believe the whole industry refers to as coffee grinds. Um, you take the burner plate off, you look inside the heat exchanger uh, burner tube, and you're going to see heating, or, or sorry, what looks like coffee grounds along the bottom of the heat exchanger. So um, the reason that, that happens, uh, 10 chances to one, is usually cross-contamination of the intake flue gas, uh, where it's getting a bit of the recycled exhaust come back in and gets reburned. That's usually a good indicator that you're getting some of that. Um, so it, it's, in some cases, you know, it is pretty unavoidable to get at least some coming back, uh, but this heat exchanger is just a little bit more prone to being susceptible to that type of application, where if you do have any recirculation of flue gases, you're definitely gonna get the coffee grinds in the bottom. 
pretty easy to clean up, doesn't take much, um, but these heat exchangers really need to be cleaned um, at, definitely once a year. Um, fire tube, maybe a little bit less often, um, but because these ones are more susceptible to that, definitely clean them once a year. Okay, up here and check for questions. Uh, what solvents do you suggest using on cleaning? Okay, so when we're talking about cleaning, Furnox makes a beautiful um, cleaner when we're talking about cleaning out a heat exchanger. Um, but to be honest with you, friends, the best one that I come across is using uh, pressurized steam to clean these guys. Um, if you can find it, if you can get, if you can get into it, uh, pressurized steam is a great way to get the the all the, the gunk inside off these inside of these heat exchangers. It's extremely good. Um, because it is stainless steel, there's no, there's no real bad option with regards to which one I, I would recommend. I just do recommend to make sure that you do clean them as best as you possibly can. Uh, and to be 100% honest, there is no substitute for a hard bristle brush to clean uh, at, at least the water tube heat exchanger. I saw one guy, um, he took a hard bristled toilet brush actually and attached it to a drill and use that to to you know clean around the inside of that heat exchanger, and it worked like crazy. The hard bristle brush is soft enough; it's not going to damage the the actual stainless steel, but it will get into those nooks and crannies um, to make sure that we get these things cleaned out as best as we possibly can. Um, Citrus surf, absolutely. Um, so that one I'm not super familiar with. I've only ever seen um, the notes for it. I've never used it myself, but uh, like I said, there's no, there's no real bad option with regards to cleaning. The most important part I can recommend is cleaning. It's like, what's the best uh, vacuum to use to vacuum your house? It really doesn't matter. When you've got a big shaggy dog like I got, just as long as you vacuum, everything's gonna be just fine. Okay, so we're gonna get now into our boiler heat exchanger protection. So we put in this brand new boiler, um, you know, your, your, your pumps cost a couple hundred bucks, your, air, your, your other pieces in there cost a couple hundred, but your boiler's costing you thousands. That's the piece to protect, bar none, absolutely 100% of the time. Look after that piece. So this is how we do it. We prevent dirt problems, but first and foremost, we gotta prevent air problems. Air in its own will lead to dirt problems. Um, and then we need to prevent hydraulic conflict, uh, meaning that it needs to see flow. Lack of flow is going to kill a heat exchanger faster than uh, anything. As that as that uh, burner is on, you know, with your 50 or 100 or 300,000 BTUs going through that burner, if we don't have a water moving through that to take that heat away, uh, that'll cause failures instantly. You you will you will crack and split um, in a heartbeat if you don't have flow through these guys. Um, a lot of these manufacturers now have a built-in flow indicators or sorry, flow switches to make sure that they turn on, um, but not all, and especially not the mid-efficiency ones, the non-condensing. You don't usually see flow indicators on any of those residential models. Um, so how do we do all this stuff? So let's talk about the initial dirt sources. How does dirt even get into a system in the first place? Well, if we're doing a uh, iron pipe system is definitely going to get in from the threading of the pipe. You're going to see little metal filings um, on the pipes that you've just threaded and it could be, you know, very, very small pieces, but they still get into a system that is classified as dirt inside your system. If you are using Teflon tape, dope, um, anything like that to ensure any leaks with your NPT connections, that absolutely can let go um, or, or kind of chip off or flake off and create uh, more dirt, site, dirt sources inside of your uh, water uh, and inside your hydronic system. Um, so you, if you are doing a copper system and you're doing solvents, uh, your, your flux uh, from your solder can get in there. Even little solder balls on the inside, they can let, let loose and come across. Um, a little solder ball hitting, hitting the impeller of a pump, that could be game over right there. Um, not in all the cases, you know, in some cases it is going to pass through and uh, we'll catch it somehow, but we're talking about, you know, worst case scenarios. And that's how, it, you know, these pieces can get in there. Um, if you're doing an HDPE system where you're fusing the pipe together, this, for example, is a geothermal system. Uh, I believe this one's in Chicago that this picture was taken. But anyway, um, those little plastic filings that you get when you cut this pipe, uh, they can let loose and they can get into these systems. Not as common with fused systems as when you fuse pipe together, usually it all kind of melts those uh, uh, 
plastic fragments together, but it's not to say it's not possible, not to mention the fact that if you're doing any work uh, outdoors, you do have to be cognizant of the fact that these pipes might be in the dirt and mud and stuff like that. Code reference, CSA B214, 4.5.2. All heat sources and pipings and tubing shall be flushed after installation. So before you turn it on, all systems are designed to be flushed. Now let's talk about flushing here real quickly. When we say flushing, we, we mean flushing. You gotta move that water through this system. What I recommend doing, isolating the boiler, having that just, you know, on its own, you can flush that its own individually. You wanna be calm so you don't like dr drive anything through that. Um, but the rest of the system, you need to move water and you need to move it fast. Uh, five feet per second is what we're looking for to get crap out of a system. So I, I, I know that that term is, you know, how fast is five feet per second? It's fast. You want to move this water through here. Again, you're doing a flush pretty much as fast as you can. I have uh, a lot of friends in the industry. What they'll do is they'll use um, uh, recycled hot tub pumps. Those are designed to move a lot of, a lot of water really fast. You hook that up to a fill and flush cart or a 50 gallon drum uh, with a couple of pipes connected to either side of it and zip that water through it. Uh, I've seen some commercial jobs where, you know, we're talking, you know, five inch piping. Uh, I've seen gloves come out of these piping when we do our flushing and whatnot. Um, and if we don't get it out in the first time, the worst case scenario is it's going to get stuck usually in one of the air bleeders. Um, as it's kind of popping out of a system. And if that air bleeder gets stuck open, then we're just gonna be popping out fluid for the whole duration of the system and while it's unattended. Uh, so flushing is super important. Make sure that you get in it, move that water, move it fast. Okay, ongoing dirt formation. Now this is what I'm talking about. Like we can get the dirt out pretty easily. We just be cognizant of what we're doing, give it a flush and that will take care of the vast majority of the dirt that'll come with the initial uh, creation of a system. Then we have the dirt formation during system operation. Those are usually, you know, we'll, we'll get to the lime scale um, or the scaling buildup. Um, but what I want to talk, talk about really is the oxidization of the ferrous metals inside of a system. Um, the most standard pumps in the world, uh, you're talking about your Grumpus, uh, 1558, 2699, talking about your Taco. Uh, 007s, 0013s, and now they're double fit, 0015s, 0018s. Um, still, if they have a cast iron volute to them, that's still ferrous metal inside of a system, and that's still going to be uh, subject to oxidization. Now, if you're doing your system in all copper or all PEX or stuff like that, you are limiting the amount of ferrous metal, but you're still having it in there usually with the pumps. So oxidization happens, and it's quite easy to make it happen. All it requires is air and melt that reacts with air. That's it. What do those two things make? This uh, sludge buildup inside of these boilers. Um, so as we oxidize and we get that sludge buildup, what essentially is just, uh, you know, fer ferrous metal iron particles um, floating around inside of a system, that's what will lead to this style buildup. Now, the old cast iron systems that we used to use and still do use in some applications, um, I get to comment all the time, so well, those things never, you know, had any scale build up inside of them. They ran for 20 years, which is true. They did. They, they absolutely worked a very, very long time. The difference being um, the jackets inside of these uh, cast iron units are huge. Uh, lots and lots and lots of room for that scale to build up and build up and that sludge to build up inside of it where you're not having uh, any real impeding on the flow. They're designed actually with that in mind that they are going to have, you know, that build up on the inside of it. Um, so what we want to do, uh, is we want to make sure that we limit that as much as we can, because nowadays, well, we don't have those big jackets anymore, uh, to, to hold that sludge inside of it. Now we're very tight heat exchangers. Um, here's this Cermetta here, the D Giannone, um, it's a little bit of, uh, the sludge buildup on the inside of it creates a hot spot. Cause again, if that water can't hit that stainless steel to take that heat away. If there's a bit of sludge inside of that that's stuck there, if I can't move that heat away, I eventually blister and I crack um, the heat exchanger. So on the right hand side of that picture there, you can see a little tiny crack. Um, well, that crack absolutely just destroyed that entire system. Um, all that was caused by a tiny little bit of uh, sludge inside of a system. So these things happen. And we want to talk about how to stop them from happening by stopping ongoing dirt formations. Like I said, all it takes is air and metal that reacts with air. 
We can't take away the metal that reacts with air, so let's get the air out. There's two basic types of air removal devices inside of your system. There's your high point air vent, um, really good for doing your system fills. Uh, they automatically vent the air out. When the water gets up to the top, the flow comes up and stops them. And again, essentially they are sealed. Um, they work great the first time. They usually work the second time and then they start to have a, you know diminishing returns the, the more times that we ask them to do that autofill system um the bad ones work once the good one works a couple times and the really good ones work a couple more times other than that um and that's basically all the life you're going to get out of them get the good ones though if you you know spend an extra dollar you can get the ones that you can service and take apart and clean up and get a couple and like more life expectancy out of them uh even so that being said you shouldn't be taking them apart all too often anyway but this is not the way that we that i recommend doing getting air out of the system i much more prefer the high efficiency air separators your central air separators your micro bubblers whatever you want to call them but that's the way you get an air out between that and doing a proper system design where you can bleed the air out, usually in the mechanical room, those two pieces combined with, an, with a high efficiency air separator, you're gonna get the air out absolutely every single time. Couple key rules to follow with high efficiency air separators. Number one, it should be the very first thing that the boiler sees. Um, so, you want, you want high temperature and low pressure. That's where uh, your, your lowest air solubility is in water. If you're gonna put a pot of, of water on the stove to boil uh, without a lid on it, you notice that you see your air start to come out of that water very, very quickly as soon as you start heating it up. And that's exactly what we're talking about. So hottest water, lowest pressure. So on the suction side of the pump, you're gonna have that, that air, it doesn't wanna be very, it doesn't wanna mix into the water, it wants to come out of the water, great place to get it out. So do stuff like that, you're gonna have all sorts of success um, with getting air to the system. Had a question come in here, uh, poly B infor systems are hard to flush, they seem release flakes for the first year of operation. That is a super interesting point. I haven't heard that one before, but I'll tell you what I'll do. Uh, we, we do take all the, we do take a record of all the comments inside of these. For the ones that I'm just honestly friends that I'm not familiar with, we will get back to you with regards to what we know and things that we can recommend to help with that. So your question about poly B uh, flaking off, we'll get back to you. We'll let, let you know about what I can tell you about that. So getting back to getting the air out, um, again, super important point, CSA B214 code reference 12.6.1, Provision shall be made to get rid of the air inside of a distribution piping system. Um, and 1262, an air separation device shall be incorporated in the closed loop heat system. You don't have an option anymore. You have to have an air separators in there. Um, I see people try to save some dough uh, by not putting in an air separator, just that high point um, air removal. Um, you really don't have that as an option. You gotta use the high efficiency air separator. Um, so with that being built in, and it even tells you where they where they want it to go. Um, these are systems now that we are seeing a lot more of. Now, some of these air separators are better than others. You have your standard air scoop. Uh, Taco and Antrol made them for years, where it's basically just a big cast iron log with a couple scoops on the inside that, as it went through, saw a bit of a pressure drop. The air rise to the top and got scooped out and put out the air vent on the top. Where the new ones, these new high efficiency ones, um, they do a bit of a different sort of application. So the way that they work um, is they actually create a bit of um, turbulence as the, as the air is kind of coming through them. Um, got a better picture here coming up in just a little bit. Here we go. So this is what's happening. Your water's coming through your air separator and it's hitting the, the media on the inside. There's a bunch of different pipes. Uh, um, some people use those little rings. Some people use a stainless steel mesh. Some people use the polymer uh, mesh on the inside. Um, and what's happening is it's hitting that and it's creating that, that, that turbulence. Like I said, it's like cu cutting up the water. A good example of what this looks like, if you take a water bottle and shake it, you'll see those bubbles come out of solution. That's kind of what it's doing. But here in this case, the system is under pressure and those bubbles that we create by creating this turbulence under pressure, they need some place to go. So with the coalescing media on the inside, be it whatever it is, it all sticks together. And as those bubbles stick together, 
they all kind of formate larger and larger. And as they move to the top, eventually that's how they spit themselves out. Now, this is an extremely efficient way of getting air out of a system. And I mean extremely. Um, I mentioned a couple slides ago, Mother Nature loves balance. And with regards to water, the water is in its natural form carries high levels of oxygen. So what we're doing in hydronics is we're getting that air out. So if we get it out and start to pull it out of the solution, like, like water solution, we now start to pull air back into water solution by little air pockets other, uh, elsewhere in the system. Maybe you have a 90 that during the flush and fill didn't quite get that last little bit of air out of the top corner of that uh, uh, elbow. So the flow through that is a little bit slow. Over time, and usually it's not very long at all, about 24 hours, uh, maybe a little bit longer depending on the case, but a high efficiency air separator will pull air out of a uh, system. Um, that's, that's like the little pull air pockets out of a system. Um, I see a couple cases, and again, manufacturer's instructions trump everything, but um, I had a question come to me the other day about putting expansion tanks in upside down, do it or don't do it. Um, the manufacturer says they prefer to see them, you know, right set up and away they go because it's easier to fill. But in this case here was the only way that they could do it. But the concern was that if you're not able to get enough water in there to keep that gasket inside the expansion tank wet and it needs to stay wet, otherwise it dries out and cracks. With a high efficiency air separator, you will absolutely pull the air out of that cavity and eventually fill that air or that expansion tank with water under pressure. Uh, it's designed to do that. That's what these things are designed to do is pull that air out. Um, so like I said, manufacturers instructions do trump everything, but there are different ways. And we understand that, you know, we, not every system is going to be in the perfect space where you're going to get a whole room to build these things in. If you're tight on space, there are ways that we can make nearly everything work. Okay. So that's air separation in a nutshell. Let's talk about dirt separation. There's three basic types. There is your chemical flocculants. What these do is they kind of scavenge around looking for um, ferrous particles and dirt and whatnot and kind of creates, it, 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 it clumps them together. Then here's your basket strainers, AKA the Y strainer, which I'm gonna to get to because I hate Y strainers with all my heart and soul. Um, and I'll tell you why. It's not just a needless, um, you know, issue that I have with them. There's a reason. And then you get into the low velocity zone particle separators. But let's see what we got. So here's what the, the chemical additives do inside of a system. So all that gunk inside of a system, the, uh, like I said, usually it's, it's usually ferrous particles or other, other uh, microbials or something in there. It, it, it congeals them and brings them all together. So when you do a flush of a system after doing this sort of a treatment, uh, you'll see a big amount of sludge come out, usually in the low point of a system. It makes it pretty easy to get the dirt out of a system. But if you don't have other pieces in place, you can just get that dirt built right back up again. It does make it for an easy one-time flush uh, though. So, I mean, there's nothing wrong with doing this type um, for, for the most part, if you want to go and do this every single time by adding new chemical into your hydronic system. Then there is your Y strainer. Um, now, I make no qualms about it. I don't like these things. I don't like them at all. And there's a couple of reasons. Number one, as the water comes into these guys, first of all, it needs to get stuck in the basket in order for that particle to get caught. As soon as that particle gets caught inside of the basket, it starts to lose efficiency. You're not able to have much flow go through this guy now because it's got that particle caught inside of it. And in theory, the more efficient this thing becomes by catching more and more uh, particles, you get a restriction on flow immediately downstream. Um, so it's a, just a, not a great way to get the, the, the dirt particles out of a system. Not to mention the fact that the mesh on these Y strainers, um, you, you can only catch things, you know, it's, it's quite big actually. It's, a, it's like a millimeter. Um, so the, all the particles have to be at least uh, bigger than that to get caught. Um, I mean, it doesn't do anything for the, you know, small particles of dirt inside of a system that build up and accumulate on hot spots. Second of all, these things are quite difficult to clean. Getting that little cap off of your basket, um, usually with regards to systems, these things never come apart. They never get cleaned anyway. They don't get cleaned until the whole system fails. And in that case, they don't get cleaned, they usually just get replaced. 
Um, so, like I said, not a fan of them for that reason. They're complicated to clean. They don't catch the small particles. And as soon as they do start to work, it makes the whole system less efficient. I am not a fan, but you do whatever you want. Then we get into these guys. These are your low flow zone dirt separators. So these guys, imagine you took that air separator and you just flipped it on its head. Now, with regards to getting the air out, it was using uh, gravity for the most part to have that air coalesce, climb that media out the top of blows. Now with the dirt separator, kind of the same thing happens. As the dirt particles are coming in through a system, hits the whatever media is on the inside of your dirt separator, and then gravity takes over. As you slow down the velocity of this dirt particle going through, then gravity takes over. This is, you know, whatever dirt particles is in there, for the most part, and we'll get to this, for the most part, it's going to be heavier than the water medium that it is flowing in. So as you slow its velocity, it is going to fall to the bottom. After that, it's just a quick drain out the bottom, and then away it goes. Really effective way to clean the dirt out. And because it's not relying on a screen to catch the dirt, it's using physics to catch the dirt particles, we can get all the way down to about five microns. Now, five microns in size, if you take a human hair and split that into about you know seven pieces or so, um, that's going to be five microns. So really smart, small particles can be caught in this uh, type of application with regards to a dirt separator. Now, before I go any further on this one here, um, air separators have become standard in the code, while dirt separators are not. Um, to that, I would only say this. The idea of not putting a dirt separator in a hydronic system, I would give you that exact same rebuttal. Would you ever install a furnace without putting a furnace filter in? Because it does the exact same job of this protecting the heat exchanger, the big part of the system, from getting all clogged up with garbage. Um, so if you use one system or another, I do care. I like these things better than the others, but you got to use something to get the dirt out of a system. And dirt's always going to form. Even if you use um, OxyGuard PEX, which is the lowest, uh, or sorry, in theory, a lot of people think that no oxygen is going to get through this guy and you're using, you know, copper piping and everything like that. Well, here's a bit of a shocker to the world. Even uh, O2 guard PEX, oxygen molecules absolutely still get through that. For sure they do. It's a very low solubility rate, but it does happen. It's about, uh, actually, you know, I can't remember the form off the top of my head, so I'm not going to bring it up, um, but it's not impervious to the oxygen molecule. Uh, it stops it for the most part, but some still does get through. Same as in uh, any, any sort of NPT threat. Um, the, you can still have oxygen molecules migrate into that NPT threading that, that, that you do have. Um, or, you know, just, just if other ways for oxygen to get inside of a system. And once that happens, then you get right back to that oxidization of ferrous metals inside the system. You're going to have dirt creation. You're going to need some way to get that dirt back out of the system. So food for thought, if you're not using a dirt separator or something right now for, for to catch that dirt, uh, might be something you want to consider uh, just for moving forward. Let's have a quick question pop up here. Where's the recommended place for the system for the dirt separator to go? Yeah. So I mentioned that you want the air separator to be the very first thing that the system sees. Um, it goes out, the water is nice and hot, uh, low pressure uh, coming out of the boiler before the pump, great place for air to come out of the solution. Now with regards to a dirt separator, that basically, I want that to be the last thing that the boiler sees. So the water goes out through the air separator, goes through its pumps, goes through its heat emitters, through whatever it wants, and just before that water gets back to the boiler, I wanted to go through a dirt separator to make sure that everything that it may have picked up through the system does not make it back to the boiler. We get it out before that. Let it pick up the dirt from everywhere else if it needs to, but it will not hit that heat exchanger in the boiler you're going to be taken care of there. Now, the newest kind of addition to the, oh, I two more and I'll get into this magnetic separation. Um, Air and dirt separators, do you prefer individual components? Um, Chad, I'll get to that one. That one is coming up. And are they all magnetic? 
Um, some manufacturers, with regards to this one here, Kalefi only makes magnetic dirt separators. Now they've discontinued their non-magnetic, um, just because so many dirt separators have gone to the magnetic style. So let's talk about the magnetic separation and why it even exists in the first place. Um, again, ferrous metals, as we discussed, um, they exist in almost every hydronic system. And every ferrous metal is going to give off something called magnetite. Now, magnetite's a real tricky son of a gun. That five microns I, that I told you about that a standard dirt separator will, will catch, uh, magnetite's much smaller than that. It almost will, in, in, in water, um, it almost looks like it's completely dissolved in that. Um, it's extremely small. Uh, and the only way to catch that that we found in modern hydronic systems is with magnetic separation. So these dirt separators now, some of them have the, the magnet inside the water stream, uh, some of them have the band around the bottom. Honestly, brothers, I'm telling you, or, or, or friends out there, I'm telling you, there is no real difference whether that magnet is in the water stream or around the band or anything like that, just as long as you have a magnetic portion to catch that magnetite. Um, that, that's all that, all that needs to happen. Other than that, buy the piece that you're familiar with, the one that's easy to service, the one you like. Um, and kind of move forward from there. Now, here's gonna be a quick video of a magnetic dirt separator in action. This is how this thing works. You're gonna see the ferrous metals connect to these little magnets here, um, and then how to clean it out and how to flush these systems. Really easy, but I just wanna show you how effective these are. So it's a bit of a long video, well, not too long, minute and a half, but um, it does show up quite well. So we've stopped flow to the system. We're gonna do a discharge. Magnetite falls to the bottom. Flush it till the water goes clear. That's it. That's how a dirt separator works. It's, and a magnetic dirt separator is exactly how they work. Um, now, there's two places in your system where magnets are going to be. And if you don't put two in there, you're going to have problems. The first one that's going to be is in your pumps. Um, there's already going to be a magnet inside that rotor to keep that thing spinning, especially with these variable speed pumps that are, you know, reasonably expensive. Uh, you want to make sure that you protect that because they are susceptible to magnetite. If you ever pull out one of those rotors and it's completely covered in sludge, that sludge you're looking at is caused by magnetite getting stuck to that rotor. That's what's causing that issue inside of that. So that can be pretty expensive repair. The other place that a magnet should be inside your system is in this magnetic dirt separator. Protect those expensive pumps and get that magnetite out at a place where it's designed to be serviced from. That's how you can really um, bring your system into that next level. Because if you don't get it out there, it's absolutely going to stick to those pumps or worse, it's going to stick to the inside of the heat exchanger. That magnetite is going to do you no favors inside of a heat exchanger. So, um, and again, you use whatever one kind of makes the most sense for you. Um, the the Kalefi one, that's the line that we represent uh, here at Equipco. Um, I think it works extremely well. And those magnets around the, the band uh, that kind of clips on, and even the commercial ones, they are extremely powerful magnets. They're, they're, they're stronger than the magnets that are in the pump. Um, that's why it's going to stick there um, and get caught there and not get caught inside the pump, um, just so that we all know how that one all works. So now we have a couple different pieces 
we have uh, the, the two-in-one. So this is dirt, air, and magnetic separation all built into one. Um, common question for this guy, where does it go in the system? Air is the most important thing to get out of a system. Without air, um, it's harder for, for dirt to form, it's harder for magnetite to form. So make sure that air is your primary concern. So you put this again at the start of the system where the water is the hottest, pressure is the lowest. Get that air out and have it um, kind of be the, 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 the first line of defense in the system. Um, they're still extremely effective. Um, I do like to see the two pieces rather than one piece, um, just regards to this piece, but there are uh, different pieces that we can use as well. So there's a little cutaway, what it looks like on the inside um, of their air hitting, again, that medium inside, shaking that water bottle. Uh, air comes out of solution, rises to the top and pops out. The dirt and ferrous metals falls to the bottom by gravity and the ferrous metal sticks to the band. Take the band off to your flesh and away you go. Okay, I'm gonna check here for questions quickly. Nope, all good. And we're gonna talk about the preventing of the pump conflict. So when I'm talking about preventing pump conflict, what I mean by that is we don't want a system pump pushing against a boiler pump. Um, that can create uh, too much flow going through the boiler. You start whipping it through too fast. You can erode the inside of the heat exchanger. Um, or likewise, you don't want a system pump pushing against another system pump. So the way that we design systems is going to be pertinent to make sure that we don't have uh, conflict between our piping systems. Now, this one is preventing conflict between the boiler and the system. And that is done through a set of closely spaced T's. Closely spaced T's um, are kind of the, currently in North America, one of the jewels of the system here. Um, you know, one of the questions they get for, for closely spaced T's a lot is, they're designed to be placed no more than four pipe diameters apart away from each other. But, the, you cannot place them too close together. So forget that four pipe diameters apart from each other, just put them side by side, put them as close together as you possibly can, and you're gonna have any problems at all with regards to your primary secondary circuit piping. Um, it's just a, if you, if you were too worried about making it too far apart, don't. Just put them as close together as you can, and that's how close you space tees, you want those to work. And they work on a law of uh, pressure flow through a set of closely spaced T's is what goes in must come out. Um, the, the way that they operate uh, is just like that. So as you are moving water into that loop, the exact same amount of water is leaving that loop. So that's going to create or limit uh, the amount of pushback that you can get from any of the pumps because um, this will create its own individual, own individual circuit by doing primary or secondary. Um, but preferably, that leads us into low loss headers. Now I love these things. Um, they are my favorite piece of hydronic system nowadays. Um, and I'll tell you why. Number one, it takes that boiler that you just put in, that $10,000 boiler, 5,000, 8,000, whatever it is, and it makes it its own system. It sees the flow it wants to see. It sees nothing of the system. It doesn't care what the system's doing. It just takes care of your boiler. Now, if you're doing a re and re, absolutely you want to put one of these things in. You don't know what's behind the drywall. You have no idea. Anything could be back there. Um, it could, um, maybe that system pump that was there was drastically over or slash undersized. We have no idea. But by doing a low loss header, we're making the boiler its own specific system. And, and then the heating side, that's its own specific system. So as opposed to the homeowner calling you and being like, your boiler that you just put in is broken, you can go there and it looks like, okay, the boiler's fine. There's no issues there. It's a system issue. I want to re and re, that's quite important because that's going to be talking about your, your product is fine. The system is the issue. And then for new installs, it helps you alleviate and helps diagnose what may have gone wrong with your system that you did as a whole. Um, it works in the exact same principles of closely spaced T's. Uh, what goes in must come out. Um, and they're designed to be sized so that they are the four pipe diameters apart from each other. I, actually, they, these are three, because um, like I said, you can't make them too close. Um, and what they can do is they can do all sorts of things built into one. Now, here we have up on the top there, you see this air separator into a set of closely spaced T's, into a, we'll call it a dirt separator, and then back to the boiler. So we have, in theory, two 
leak potential leak points in the air separator, four potential leak points in the closely spaced T's, and another two in the sediment strainer for a total of eight potential leak points. Um, not only that, but it's also three different pieces of equipment. Where a low less header slash hydro separator, they have all those things built into one. Uh, the air separator is built in, the closely spaced T's are built in, the dirt separator is built in. So when we're talking about putting a system underneath a set of stairs, this has got everything that you want built into one. Save that space by putting in one piece. Um, and, and you can just take care of all the issues that you're having um, with the potential of thinking, is it the boiler, is it the system? This will tell you. If the boiler's working fine, it'll be sitting there working just fine. Uh, so you'll be able to see it in real time. Um, a question I get usually, oops, I guess my animation is not working on this one. Question I get on this one is regards to where do I put the expansion tank on an air set. Um, usually I want that on the boiler return side before the pump going back into the boiler. Um, make sure that I'm pumping away from the expansion tank. Um, it's still a part of low pressure. It doesn't matter where it goes in, but it's a good place to put it is right there. Um, and I saw just a quick question pop through. I'm going to get to this one. Is the air separ no? <laughs> is the air separator as good as the separator? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's the exact same material built into that. Um, the here, uh, let me get rid of that. So this is the same material inside the hydro set that's built inside the air separator. So it's that exact same media. It still pulls out the. I think that their uh, specifications say that 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 this pulls out. I believe it's 90, 90 plus percent of all oxygen in the system and its first pass. Uh, same as the dirt separator, it pulls out 90 plus percent of all dirt in the first pass. The uh, hydro separators, um, the one from Kalefi is, uh, anyway, it is built at the exact same specifications as the individual pieces. Um, now, it's gonna cost a dollar more. It is, but let me just go back a couple slides here. Think about, Unless you're doing this job for free, you decide you don't want to make any money anymore on labor, you decided that's it, I'm wealthy enough, thank you, I'm done. You got to consider labor when you're putting these things together. So how long is it going to take you to make a set of fittings that you're going to put into this air separator and cutting the pipe accordingly to fit it in? Same as the closely spaced T's. Are you going to be welding those in? Or are they going to be threaded? And yet again, cut pipe for those pieces and then adding an additional piece with a sediment strainer. By the time you consider all your factors, and that includes your labor, not only is the hydro separator um, going to be uh, faster, much faster, um, and when you put your labor, it's probably going to be cheaper. Not only that, but it's going to maintain and be certain of the fact that you, you have your boiler flow separated from your system flow. Um, a very good friend of mine, he always used to say when it comes to hydronics, it depends. What's wrong? How much does it take? What size do I need for this? Well, it depends because everything depends on everything else in the hydronic system. But with a hydro separator, we're changing that. We're setting it on its head. Now it's just, this is just the way we do it because that is the most effective way to protect that boiler. Okay. Um, when do you use one? I always use one on, on, on re and reason my designs um, just because if you don't know what's out there in that system. You have no idea. Let's not play that game. Protect your boiler. And then on new installs, save the room. It's a great place to save room from. And when you're considering costs, consider all the costs. Just a heads up. Okay, now we're going to be getting into a bit more of the basic formulas. Now, again, this is going to come out in the PDF that uh, you're going to get from your local Equipco rep. Um, now, these are just formulas that we need in the system uh, with regards to how to size different things. I talked about before, you know, you need the proper BTUs to heat a room. In order to that, you got to hit the proper GPM flow rate to uh, get to the temperature you're looking for and then the delta T. And we have something in this, then uh, the delta T, of course, being your temperature differential. We have something in the hydronic industry called the universal hydronics formula. Um, we usually base it around the top one, GPM equals BTU divided by delta T times 500. Now, you can see there, and again, you get, you get copies of all this uh, in your email here in, in a, a couple of days. Um, but I'm going to talk about where these numbers come from. So your GPM, that's your fluid flow rate in gallons per minute. Uh, the BTU, uh, that's your um heat required to heat the area delta t of course is your temperature drop now the 500 i want to talk about that specifically where did that 500 number come from well let me tell you 
a pound, sorry, a gallon of water was 8.33 pounds. We do everything in hours, that would be to use per hour. So we times that by 60, and then we times that again by one. Now that number, that one is a specific heat of water. Uh, so that's where that comes from. And if you have your calculators in front of you, do 8.33 times 60 times one, and you'll see it's, I guess, 499.9 or something like that. And that's where that 500 comes from. But that 500 is not constant. Let's talk about glycol in a system here just for a second. Now, when we're talking about efficiency drops by adding glycol, at 25% glycol, we drop our efficiency rate by 6%. At a 50% glycol, we reduce our B2 capacity by 15%. Also should be noted, any more than 50% glycol will avoid most of boiler manufacturers' warranties. In fact, I have yet to come across a boiler manufacturer that will let you put more than 50% glycol through it. If you happen to know one, throw it out there. I'm happy to do a bit of research. At least then I'd know, but I've never seen one. Um, and let's talk about this glycol percent solution. A lot of people use the 50% glycol um, because they don't want their pipes to freeze and burst. Um, and it's extremely common in snow melt systems. But burst protection is not freeze protection. At 50% glycol, we get burst protection down to, I think it's like minus 60 or minus 70. Um, and so that is just, I, I've never seen that temperature anywhere in any of the southern provinces in Canada, ever. Um, so why would we ever put 50% glycol solution through that? Like here in, uh, like I said, I'm in B Barrie, Ontario. Uh, we are usually, the coldest temperatures that we usually get are about minus 30 is about the closest that we ever get. Now, 30% glycol gives me burst protection down to minus 35. And when I'm talking about burst protection, that's when, you're that's when your actual pipes can split and rupture and you start losing fluid. Other than that, uh, anything less than that, and the, the solution, it goes into a um, kind of like a slush type of uh, fluid concentration. Now, boilers are fine with slush. They, they can't do ice, but slush you can absolutely put through a boiler, any boiler. Um, so don't be afraid to actually talk about this glycol percent solution because instead of oversizing your boiler by 15% by using 50% glycol, Maybe you only need to oversize it by 7.5 to 8% because you know that 30% glycol is actually going to do what you need it to do instead of what you want to think that's going to happen. Food for thought. All right, um, we're getting into water quality. We are we got about half an hour left and which is good except with the time we got. Okay, when we think about water inside of a hydronic system, think of water like a conveyor belt. It delivers heat to an area via the water, and then the water comes back, picks up more heat from the boiler, takes it back out and delivers it to an area. That's how water works inside of a hydronic system. Now this slide is gonna look terrifying because of all the CA3PO42s, but this is what I'm gonna be getting at here. Remember, remember our conveyor belt. Inside water, there are minerals. Water is the great equalizer. Everything it touches, everything it touches, it dissolves. Um, very slowly, but surely, it will eat pretty much everything. So if you are in an area of the country where you have uh, high lime in the ground, maybe you have lots of limestone, it's gonna pick up the lime. Um, maybe it's gonna be an area where you're high in iron, it's gonna be thinking of the iron out of the ground. Uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, sodiums, things like that. These are all the, the ground salts that's going to be picking up as the water moves through it. Um, and as that, the, th those minerals get dissolved into the water, we refer to them as salts. Now salts have a particular set of variables about them, um, but what we refer to them as, for the most part, is hardness. So the amount of salts equals the amount of hardness in the water, how hard that water is. Now, this is a map of the approximate water quality in uh, Canada. Um, with the exception of the tip of Southwest Ontario, um, Ontario, Quebec, uh, Newfoundland, and some of the uh, Atlantic provinces have relatively decent water. Um, but once we get into our, uh, you know, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, Alberta, and 
BC, we start getting into some not great water. Um, and we get quite hard water out there. So we need to be cognizant of this and we need to start working with this because as that hard water is there, these salts are now embedded in this water. They've dissolved in this water. Now, the salts will eventually come out of solution. Whether that water is heated or cooled depends on what salts come out of solution. Particularly in this case, we want to talk about what happens to the salts that come out of solution when the water is heated. Magnesium, calcium, sodiums, they come out of solution as the temperature of water increases. And as that temperature increases, these salts now come out. Uh, the, the water can no longer hold them and that now create and eventually they stick on metal and that now becomes oops, scale. So scale is going to happen on, I, I picked this picture for a reason. Number one, it shows the inside of a fire tube heat exchanger completely covered in scale. Um, so these people that say that they are self-cleaning, this is what I'm talking about. You got to clean them up yourselves, not just the burners, but I mean, you got to do a flushing at them and make sure your water quality is taken care of. So scale happens as that water heats up, the salts come out of the solution, your hardness comes out of solution and it sticks to metal surfaces. It loves metal surfaces. So it sticks to that uh, and that creates a scale buildup. If we have scale buildup, we don't have flow. We don't have flow, we start cracking heat exchangers. And I'm not just picking on fire tube. This is a water tube heat exchanger that is completely plugged with scale. Um, we did the, uh, this is actually from a friend of mine. I can't remember the place where it is. Uh, but we did a cut apart of this heat exchanger and we saw that we were only getting flow through about eight of these tubes through about one, uh, a quarter of each tube. Everything else was completely plugged solid um, with scale and salt. Once we start to do that, we start overheating these heat exchangers. Once we do that, we start to really stress them. Um, we will cause blisters on the inside. I'll get to those. And we'll start to talk about the boiler heat exchanger just completely failing altogether. So we need to make sure we get that taken care of. Here's a picture of what a blister looks like. This is the most common thing that you actually are seeing when you're talking about a cracked heat exchanger. We have scale builds up inside the water side of that heat exchanger. And again, we have, you know, oops, then we have flame, fire, uh, be it oil, propane, natural gas, I don't care what it is, you're going to have a heat source on the other side. If I can't scrub that heat away, I'm going to blister that metal. Once I start blistering it, I start really stressing out that metal, and eventually over time, that's absolutely gonna be leading to a crack. Once it gets that hot spot and it blisters up, you're gonna be cracking there. That's what's gonna happen. So how do we get rid of the scale? The most common way to do it right now um, that I see the most of, and it's not, it's not the best way, and I'll tell you why, is softening of the water. Um, by running it through a water softener, um, essentially what you're doing is you're changing everything now to sodium ions. Now these sodium ions, although they don't stick so much um, to metals, they don't have that scaling potential, but we're now leaving the water pretty electrically conductive. Um, so we're, we're increasing that electrical conductivity inside the water. So as we increase that, well now we can start getting other problems inside of a session. Now you start to uh, erode things from the outside in. Um, by, you know, if, if it's able to uh, conduct electricity, it's going to. And this is what I mean by that. It's not just with regards to, you know, grounding out those pipes. Well, do that as much as you can, but it'll pick up that electricity and start to erode on, you know, all the systems from the outside in by things as simple as static electricity in the air. You can have problems with that. Um, you have problems on your connections. Any die, sorry, any, uh, by metal connections. Um, if you're not using a really top quality uh, dielectric union, it'll absolutely fail in that area. Filling it with soft water. I hear a lot of people, you know, they get their horror stories about dielectric unions. Um, and a lot of those cases, once we do a bit of diving in and figuring out what's going on, it's usually filled with softened water from inside the house. Um, and unless it's a top quality dielectric union, it's going to fail. And not only that, 
that is really what they're designed to do anyway. They're designed to take that failure inside of themselves as opposed to having that failure be somewhere else more catastrophic inside the system. At least with the, with the, with the union, you can change those out. Anyway, softened water does decrease scale, but it creates another problem. So what other options do we got? Um, that's not going to create, you know, high sodium levels, which can, you know, cause accelerate uh, our corrosion of the exterior and some interiors of the metal. We can move our thoughts now to demineralization. Now, demineralization, oops, demineralization, we can do either in existing systems, we can fill a system with it, um, but it's doing essentially the same thing as a water softener where we're doing an ion exchange. But in this case, when we're talking about our ion exchange, we're only talking about changing it now with um, hydrogen, um, oxygen, hydroxide anions uh, to create at the very end of it, once we do our ion exchange, pure dihydrogen monoxide, H2O, pure water. Um, that's the closest we can possibly get to being as close to pure water as possibly can by doing demineralization. When you remove these other salts and minerals from the water, you're leaving it with these guys. And that is essentially what we're looking for. Um, now we don't want to go down way too low. You don't need to. When you go down too low by uh, doing a demineralization, by dropping your total dissolved solids too low, you can create what's called hungry water. Again, Mother Nature loves balance. This water is used to having some sorts of minerals in it. If you take it all out, it's gonna pull those minerals back in from anywhere it possibly can. We're talking about it'll, it'll strip away the inside of copper, the inside of ferrous metal. Um, it'll pull all of that inside of it. So it'll do as much damage as it can, or as much damage as other sorts of metal by pulling these uh, other ions from other areas. Um, now this is a manufacturer's instruction. This is a water quality um, test, uh, sorry, water quality, um, uh, levels that are required by a manufacturer. I'm pretty sure that this one is Wiesman. And if we look down here, it's looking for a total dissolved solids between 50 and 300. Um, it knows that anything, you know, above that, we're talking about way too much scale that can possibly happen in the system. Um, and anything too far lower than that, and you can be talking about um, creating some hungry water. Although you can go down to about 20 to 30 and still have absolutely no problems. Um, but boiler or manufacturer rules trump everything. This is actually a note from MI Thermal. Um, it talks about, again, how many grains hardness is it looking for? Nothing above that. It also talks about the pH that it needs. And when it gets, if, it, if you have a heat exchange or failure and these things get back to the manufacturer, like, well, it's completely full of uh, scale. Obviously it was filled with something heavier than seven grains or if they see it had any acid blisters on the inside, you know, the water was too acidic or too basic. Um, these are things that they're gonna test for. If it comes up to that, the warranty will be rejected. Um, set one question and question pop through. Is distilled water right to fill a system with? Distilled water is not terrible to fill a system with. Um, the only thing that I would say is again, when you get down to that just complete basic H2O, you do create a bit of hungry water. So if you do that, you must put in a chemical additive, um, something like a stabilizer or oxygen scavengers, some sort of stabilizer to make sure that you're not gonna have a, um, like I said, it's not creating that hungry where it's gonna be pulling ions from wherever it possibly can. Um, and you can check this stuff. We get, we get tools all over the place to check this stuff with. Um, standard pH tester, uh, it, it tests pH and total dissolved solids. Buy them on Amazon for 20 bucks or something like that. Um, and check that water as it's going in. Make sure that it is in line with the manufacturer's recommendations. Um, we also have portable demineralization filters. Uh, essentially, this acts like a water softener, but it just is portable. It travels with you. Um, and oops, we'll bring some pictures here. The body itself, you have your resin bags. That is your, essentially what they're doing. That's doing your ion exchange. And then it comes with a TDS meter built into it. Now, this is a Kalefi piece. Um, and you know, I'm not, I'm not exactly trying to showcase, uh, everything by this company, but they just make some extremely good products. You use what makes sense for you. Um, so with a TDS meter on the top, you can fill it, uh, to the specifications of the boy and the manufacturers and know that you're going to have the top quality, uh, the best water in there. Um, I will say though, still with demineralization of water, there's nothing wrong with adding chemical compounds, nothing wrong with adding, uh, your, your, your stabilizers to that water. There is nothing wrong with that at all. Or boiler protectors, whatnot. 
Uh, there's two different ways to pipe these guys. Uh, we have our, this is if we're doing a brand new fill. If we're filling a system, you get your once through. So the water coming in from whatever garden hose you're filling it with, run it through the system, and then you get into a set of T's like that. And you can either make them or buy them or go into some hose bibs inside of a system and fill the system, away you go. Um, or re and re, you're getting back into that product where you're, again, you're looking to make the system now as best as you possibly can. You can do a recirc method through these guys. You recirc it, you run it through, um, pull off water samples every now and again, check your TDSs, make sure that you're gonna be within your desired area that you're looking for. Um, basically, there is, a, and I got a quick video coming up that'll show you how these things work. And here it is right here. And it'll tell you about how much water you can get through. So we're gonna watch this real quick, friends. Hi, I'm Cody Mack with Kalefi North America. And thank you for choosing a Kalefi Hydrofill. This quick installation tip video will give you a brief overview on how to use your brand new Hydrofill water treatment filling unit. One of the first things that you should notice when you open the box is a set of operation instructions for your new hydrofill. Be sure to follow them and read them carefully because they will give you everything that you need to know. The hydrofill is used to fill closed loop hydronic systems with demineralized water using tap water available on site. What you may not realize is that in most cases, the tap water available on site does not meet the strict requirements for water quality set forth by the equipment manufacturers, thus the need for the hydrofill. So let's go over the features on the two hydrofill models that we have available. The two bag model that we have here is going to have an on off valve at the very bottom with a three quarter inch garden hose thread connection. We're gonna have a three quarter inch garden hose thread connection on top as well with a cap. You're gonna have a TDS meter on top which is gonna measure your total dissolved solids in parts per million. You'll notice here that the two bag model is going to be fairly portable and pretty small while our four bag model is going to have a nice stainless steel cart to help you get it around. Depending on your site water, you'll be able to get about 1,000 or more gallons of treated water out of your two bag model and roughly about double that out of our four bag model. Operation of the hydrofill is pretty straightforward. You're going to connect your site water up to the bottom connection here and then out of the top, you're going to take that to your fill point of your system or if you're using the demineralized water to blend with glycol. Once you've made your connections to the hydrofill, you're going to want to slowly open the valve at the bottom of the unit. At this point, you're going to want to keep an eye out for any leaks that might be occurring at any of your connections. At that point, you can depress the yellow lever at the top to assist in purging any air out of your hose or in the hydrofill unit itself. Before making any connections to your hydrofill, we highly recommend testing your site water. We offer a multifunction meter that tests pH as well as total dissolved solids. So I've been showing you how to use our hydrofill using our two bay unit as a demonstration. Here next to me here, I've got our four bag unit, which has two more resin bags inside of it and actually doubles your capacity on treated water. Uh, it also includes our nice stainless steel cart here to help you move it around. So again, you've got your hoses connected and you're filling up your system. You are gonna to wanna to make sure to keep an eye on that TDS meter that's on the very top. When you start filling the system, you're going to see roughly about zero parts per million, maybe up to 10 parts per million. As the resin bags start to get depleted, then you are going to start seeing it creep up a little higher and a little higher. At 30 parts per million, we do recommend changing out the resin bags. So let me show you how to do that. First, you're going to want to shut off your site water supply, wherever you're getting that from. Then you're going to want to shut down the drain valve at the very bottom of the uh, hydrofill unit. At that point, if your hydrofill is connected to a system that you're filling, you're going to want to isolate that as well. Then you can disconnect all of your hoses from the hydrofill, and then take it over to a floor drain, open up the bottom valve again, and drain all the water from your hydrofill unit. Once the water has drained from your hydrofill, you're going to want to come behind it here, and you're going to want to depress the yellow lever. This is going to allow you to unlock the lid and pull it off. So you'll twist it a quarter turn, and then lift up on it, and it'll pop right off. And we'll set the lid aside. Removal of the resin bags is pretty straightforward. You're just going to grab a hold of the top of them and pull them out and set them aside here. We do offer replacement resin bags for the two and four bag models. You'll also want to make sure to keep the drain valve open at the very bottom so that way if there's any suction pulling out that last bag it'll make your life a little easier. Your replacement bags are going to come in a nice tightly sealed bucket that we've got here. This bucket is a four bag replacement bucket. 
You'll notice that when you pull the bags out, they're going to be quite damp. It is very important that these resin bags remain damp and don't dry out completely as it will reduce the effectiveness of the resin bags. Uh, the same thing holds true when you go to stop using the hydrophil unit. You're going to want to drain out most of the water, but you're going to want to close off the valve at the bottom and put the cap back on. Oh my God. Well, I don't know if anyone out there can can still hear me there. Uh, yeah, the, everything has seized on us. My 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 computer just completely overheated and shut down. So that's a bummer. Um, I got a slight backup plan I might be able to help us out with here. Um, all that's left is our piping schematics, and then that was going to essentially be it, um, which I do always carry those with me so bear with me here and let's talk about piping you see when we do things live anything can happen this is the uh this is the world we live in the future is now we're getting by um and it's interesting and we're learning but pickups happen and uh again truly sorry about that uh computer just completely just completely shut down on me. I've never panicked that before in my life, but having some fun, aren't we? All right, give me one sec while I figure out how to um, flip this. Here we go. Okay. So let's talk about piping systems. This is your standard in and out proving pisum, proven piping system. Um, you get right from the boiler, right into your pump, and then you go out to your rads and i'm sorry it's a little fuzzy i'm doing this through my iphone um but here we go we're going to talk about a couple key features with regards to uh pipe, proven pipe systems right here number one always pump away from the expansion tank what expansion tank does is essentially is your cushion inside the system so as it if you're pumping into it it is taking all that pressure that that pump is creating and it's taking it and it's absorbing it as it does that, you're not going to have, you may not have enough pressure left to fill through the rest of that system and get your flow going. Now, I'll also take this time to talk about fill pressure of a system. Um, super common question how do we know what pressure is to fill the system to? You take your highest point of the system, you measure what that is in height between the boiler and the highest point of the system. So if that is essentially let's just say that it is you know 20 feet it's a two-story building you take that height you take your 20 feet times that by 0.4 and then add five that gives you a fill pressure the reason you times by 0.4 is that you know when we're talking about uh psi to, to feet of head you know one psi is 2.3 feet ahead it takes one psi to lift water 2.3 feet so if we know that um we have that one psi to go 2.3 feet when we do the math when we work it out to times by 0.4, that gives us approximately the number that, we're work, that we want to get to. And then you add five to get that bit of an extra pressure boost to get the air out. It, the Adding a pressure system gets the air out um, a little bit easier. So that's all we're going to talk about that one. Piping system number one, in and out system. The thing to keep in mind is that each rad will drop in temperature uh, as it kind of goes down. 
Next system, we have standard internet, but we have now monoflow T's. So these T's combined with rad valves will provide that we have the water going to the rads that we want and make sure that we're ensuring flow through those rads. We don't see them a ton anymore, but it does still come up from time to time. And again, this is what we want to talk about for the things that you're seeing when you get into a system. So you want to be familiar with, yeah, okay, I've seen this before, I know that this works, um, or I've seen this before and it's piped wrong, so I know what I can do to get this particular system to work again. Again, only issue here is that each rad is gonna see a decreasing temperature as we give it off to that, that zone beforehand. Now that'll be the designer's problem to accumulate or sorry, to accommodate when they're doing a job. Um, so that's gonna be something that we're just gonna have to all talk about beforehand as to how you wanna do it, how the system's already designed, uh, if it's a new design and whatnot like that. Um, we then have our standard two pipe direct return system where we go out, we hit each rad. Now each rad is now seeing a direct supply off the main supply line and then all we're turning into one common return. The only issue that you might have with these systems, and again, they work, it absolutely works, but balancing a system like this with balancing valves is required. You have to do some sort of balancing. Now, if you get into the next system, there's my nose, my super good writer, right? Air handler, snow melt, yada, yada, yada. Now the next system, is a two pipe reverse return system. So this means that our first system out is the last one back. Now a system like this can really help to, when you do a reverse return, that kind of does an automatic balancing of the system to make sure that everything's gonna see the proper flow that uh, it's required to see. Again, you don't see these a whole lot anymore though anyway, but we're happy to design like this if that's the way you and your customer want to do it. Now this gets into a much more common system that we're seeing out there in the industry. This is called a, this is a, um, a kind of a branch header system where we have our supply branch and our return branch. We go out into our system, each zone's got its own pump, zones into whatever our heat load is, and then it comes back into its own common return. You see the, the supply and the return never touch on these guys. So you can't use this with all boilers. Some boilers require a primary secondary where the boiler's gotta get its own flow. But for a standard high mass, where it's gonna get lots of water on the inside anyway, this is a great way to do it, really cost effective um, if you want. Um, it doesn't involve the hydro separator, but again, not everyone can afford that. Maybe you don't have the budget for it, but you still need to get heat into the house. This can be an option for you, but I would still add a dirt separator somewhere in there. Again, if you don't put a filter in your furnace, then you don't need to use one in your boiler, but I guarantee you got one in your, in your furnace though, don't you? Now, here we go. Now this is a much larger system. This is a primary series, sorry, primary secondary series where we have our primary loop for our boiler, and then what we get out to is we get into our hottest zones first, which is our indirects, our air handlers, and then so on and so forth. Now again, this temperature will drop as it goes on though. So it does have its fallbacks or its, its, its issues that it might have in the system, but it's still a fine way to pipe it. The boiler gets its primary loop as it's designed to, in case, if that's the case for the boiler manufacturer wants to see primary secondary. And then each zone is set with its own set of closely spaced T's to bring that water back and make sure that you get proper flow through your zone. Now, here is that same, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Here's a very similar system as well to that, but now we're getting into a kind of a different type of piping system. So we have our primary loop going out, we have a pressure activated bypass because we're zoning with zone valves in this case here. Now this circ pump is gonna be designed to handle all these zones at max flow. But as these zones close off, if they get satisfied, this pump is not gonna be able to slow down. So you need the pressure activated bypass. If you have a variable speed pump though, however, based on pressure or delta T, I don't care which one you use, delta P, delta T, um, whatever, just a variable speed pump that works, you have your pre preferences and I'm happy to work with those with regards to your designs. You don't need to have a bypass between your primary and your secondary, or your, your, your supply and your return header. You just need this pump to be based on uh, the flow rate for, for each individual loop, or sorry, for the whole thing as a, as a whole, but as each individual one closes, this pump's now gonna slow down and speed up accordingly. Now, last two we got here. Well, I swear I got one more after this. 
Now, this system is the, the, the parallel primary secondary system, where it's got its primary branch header, and then we pull off of each individual um, branch as it gets into its supply and return. I don't do a whole lot like this anymore. It's the same as like doing injection mixing. Um, I just don't do those anymore. There's no need for that. We have better pumps and better system designs to do that. However, what we're showing you is systems that work. Um, so you're going through your, your, your branch supply header, and then your set of closely spaced T's for each loop that's coming out, and then a balancing valve for your return. Um, now this is a much more common system nowadays. So we have our boiler coming out, creates this primary loop, those hydro separator, our branch headers with pumps. Now Canada is a pumping market. We zone with pumps. We're not huge on zone valves up here for whatever reason. Again, I'm not here to judge. I'm only here to talk. Um, you do whatever one you so desire, but this is a very good uh, representation of what a common hydronic system looks like nowadays. Boiler, hydro step, which got our air, dirt, and magnetic built into it, back into the boiler. System does its own thing with each pump on its own header, doing its own thing that it needs to do. This flow on the system side never interferes with the, with the flow on the boiler side. And that's extremely common. Um, this is actually the vast majority of ways that I design my systems nowadays. Um, and then finally, if you ever wanted to zone using a manifold, by all means, please do. Um, you can absolutely do that. There's nothing wrong with going into a set of manifold and then balancing off of your, off of your manifold. You can do that, um, no problem at all. Now, again, we're just gonna see what we can do about flipping this background. Okay, so finally, the only thing that I didn't really get into today, and this is again more of a level two piece, is I didn't get into using a buffer tank for small zones um, or using uh, an indirect as a buffer tank, but that is more of a uh, series two uh, type of install. So essentially, um, that's basically all that I've got to talk about here, with the exception of domestic hot water, which I'll just let the cat out of the bag because I don't really slice to go along with it. 40,000 BTUs makes one gallon per minute. We operate off of a ground water temperature on average of about 40 degrees on the coldest day of the year. And that's what we want to heat from, is we want to base it on the coldest day of the year. So we heat from that 40 degrees to 120 degrees, which is your 80 degree delta T. Now, nobody in the world showers at 120 degrees, way too hot, way too hot. You're more along the lines of about 105-ish, 103, something like that. So your delta T is actually smaller than, than the 80 degrees, but the industry standards, we need to heat it to 120 degrees for other various reasons, not just for showering, washing dishes, feeding your dishwasher, yada, yada, yada. So by doing that, we take our 8.33 times our 80 degree delta T times 60, and that's how we figure out to get one gallon per minute. Um, it takes 40,000 BTUs to get one gallon per minute. You wanna know how I size tankless? I size them by that. Um, how many showers do they have in the house? Work the flow rate for each shower, okay. That's how I size them, run it by the 40,000 BTU. Are they ever gonna shower on 120? No, so what, what that means is that it'll power the amount of showers they have, plus give them the, that buffer zone to be able to heat a sink or a tap or something like that. Um, just that, that little extra load. That's also, by the way, in case you're wondering how recovery on a standard water heater works, it's about that same thing as well. Um, standard water heater, 40 gallon, 40,000 BTUs, you're gonna get over the course of an hour, time, do, do your math, and that's roughly what the recovery inside of a hot water tank is as well. The only difference is it's slightly less because we're constantly adding cold water to that tank, and you get stratification. Um, and then I think that that's going to roughly be it. I think I might be able to see. Yeah, I got questions coming in here. Beautiful. Okay, hold on a second. We even got some questions. Um, okay, and BC. Oh, BCU zone bells. Oh people after my own heart. I got no problem with zone valves at all. I love zone valves. Um, Ontario, nope. Uh, Saskatchewan, nope. Atlantic provinces, nope. Um, they use less electricity, they cost less, um, they're extremely efficient, they're easy to service. I don't know why people, why more people don't use zone valves, um, but they don't. So that kind of drives me a little bit bananas. It's just, it is the way it is. <laughs> like I said, I'm not here to point fingers or tell you the absolute best way to do everything. I'm just here to have that conversation about what I know and sharing my knowledge with everyone out there. Um, so essentially, that's about going to be it, my friends. Uh, I, I'm, I thank you so much for bearing with us here through that uh, little hiccup that we had. This was uh, 
this was an interesting one. So we have never had my computer overheat before. I guess I was just way too awesome for it or too handsome or something like that. But you got a close up of the worst beard in HVAC. And uh, again, really appreciate everyone stopping in. I'm just gonna sit here and I can still see some questions coming in. Um, I consider you all good. If you have anything else that you wanted to talk about and chat about, I'm gonna hang out here for a couple minutes. Um, really appreciate it again. This was a ton of fun. As always, I love talking about hydronics. Um, we can go uh, into the level two. We're gonna be building a whole house. How we size pumps, how we get into um, calculating flow rate through PEX versus pipe and stuff like that. Uh, yes, you were gonna get a PDF uh, with all the PDF. Um, what it's going to be is a lot more details and formula. I've actually got it in front of me here. You're gonna get a lot more of these type things with uh, charts and graphs. So this particular chart that I've got in front of me, I'm not doing a great job at it. I, I know it's you know out of focus and I'm sorry, but this chart is a flow rate chart. It shows me what size pipe I need to carry what BTUs or what delta T. Spoiler alert, three quarter inch pipe is not the size of pipe you need to carry 150,000 BTUs. I know, right? Crazy, I actually need a bigger pipe than that. Um, can you do certain things? Yeah, you can pump it real fast and you know degrade the interior of your pipe. But for the most part, if you size it right the first time, it's just, it's just all about being problem free. You don't need problem free. And if you know some other guy comes along and he's gonna charge uh, you know, $5,000 less, have a look at what he's offering. He might be do, do, doing the whole job in half inch pecs. You know what? You don't want that problem. Establish your budget first with your customer. Find out what success looks like and get there. Call people like us. We're here to help. Um, yeah. And oh, we had a couple more questions coming through. Um, yeah. Thanks. Th thanks to you too. That thank you so much. This was this was wild. This was this was a crazy one. Um, I really enjoyed. Uh, I, I I really enjoyed this one a lot. Um, but, but you all still, you know, hung with me there, and we got through it together. So you, you're the rock stars. I just sit here and play the uke. Um, a little bit more here. So Austin, absolutely. Uh, again, we record all these notes as they come through anyway. There's some questions that I wasn't able to get to. I didn't, didn't know them. So everything that we went over is going to be taken down and we'll get the notes out for any questions that came up to all the team as well. Uh, is there going to be a part two? Hell yeah, absolutely. Like I said, this is part one. This is your, this is your overview. This is the general one for the, you don't know what you don't know and this is to start the conversation. Level two, we get really in depth with it and we, what we do is we build a house. Um, we take it right from a heat loss schematic to, okay, what do you want to put in here? We want to do a rad. I'm, I'm not too sure, Monica. Uh, we will get to that one as soon as we possibly can. We know there's a lot coming down the pipeline right now for everyone. A lot of trainings coming through. Um, we are doing our best to try to attend and, um, and host. Um, but I, I tell you, though, you know, as, as the trainer, we, if you want to talk to me one-on-one -on -one at any time, you can call me and I'm happy to answer any questions uh, about any of these levels that you possibly have. Um, do you lose efficiency when you have a higher return temperature? So with regards to a condensing boiler, if you don't make that unit condense, yeah, absolutely. You are losing that efficiency. You're not making it sweat. Um, the more you can make it sweat, uh, by, by bringing colder water back to it, you get that more efficiency. Like I said, 900 BTUs per gallon of condensate that you create uh, per hour. That's how you get these 90 plus percent efficiencies out of boilers. For other than that, uh, they're just, you know, high 80s uh, efficient burners. Um, now, on, on the flip side, if you bring cold water back, colder water back to a non-condensing boiler, uh, it's not so much lower efficiencies or higher efficiencies you're, you're going to get but you are gonna kill your heat exchanger by giving it that condensate from the nitrogen in the atmosphere, creating nitric acid in the condensate, which you don't want that. Um, John, you're exactly what I've been seeking. Thank you. Um, we are, uh, 
we said, we're, we're happy to help. And again, um, I didn't say it enough, but you call me anytime. 647-883-8006. Call your local Equip Co. rep, whatever we can possibly do. Um, we know that this was an intro, but if you have a more advanced uh, project that you want to work on, I'm not, I, I don't want to get too far into it today, um, but if you want a more advanced project, one-on-one, -on -one, you call us. We're, we, we can take you as far down as you possibly want to go. Um, you, just, you just let us know, my friends. Uh, so when someone's using baseboard, would you recommend a high mass, high mass boiler? Okay, when it comes to a baseboard, um, with regards to the recommendation, all I'm saying is that size it the way you want that to work. This again, this comes back to what I'm talking about. This is based on what success needs to look like and budget. If they have the budget for a high efficiency boiler and they want to put in baseboard, either A, size it in a way that'll make that boiler sweat by putting in more baseboard, but you still get the BTUs required a lower temperature, or have them understand that if they don't want tons of baseboard everywhere, that you need to run at a higher temperature. And although they're paying $10,000 for a condensing boiler, it's all for, you know, $10,000 for a condensing boiler at 96%, these baseboards are only gonna be running the system at 90%. So is that something that they want to do? And just have that open conversation. Talk to them. Talk to your homeowners. Um, when they are putting in hydronics, they want to know. And if you're not comfortable explaining all the details, that's what reps are for. That's exactly what we're here for. Have us be on that call as well. Um, we can go over all this stuff with the homeowner. And it's not just about getting the biggest dollar amount for the job i love making money it makes me super happy just got to do the right thing as well and let them know exactly what they're in for um cool so that looks like that was about it for questions thank you everyone so much this has been a blast uh talk about uh, thinking on your feet uh you stop by anytime give me a call um give your local rep a call anything we can possibly do we can go get your back okay friends i'm gonna play you out that's gonna be it for me um thank you all